Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to a special Comic Art Spotlight. This would normally be a Comic Art Live evening, but the other gentlemen like to have their one week off every three weeks, so you get me and special guests. So uh, welcome to the show. I hope everybody checked out last night's Best Of and 18th Cap Anniversary show. It was a lot of fun. It kind of felt like the Academy Awards in some bizarre way, but uh, I didn't do the best job on it, but I look forward to doing it again next year. I'm sure we'll we'll make it, uh, there'll be a lot more better production value out of the show a year from now. And uh, don't forget that the Dueling Dealers show is tomorrow evening too at nine o'clock. I don't think that uh, you're going to want to miss that one. It's going to be a lot of fun. Both guys are actually prepared this time. So and uh, and I would re be in trouble if I didn't mention this because my wife and daughter keep reminding me and I keep forgetting. But if you guys are enjoying what we do on the show and you're on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. It's uh, somewhere about right there and it would make their day. And we're, we're moving right along. We needed to get to a thousand so I can get some more promotional tools out there uh, from YouTube. And I think we're almost to 900. So it was pretty good. I think we got about almost a hundred subscribers since I kind of put out the call for that last Thursday. So I do appreciate everybody who has uh, uh, and uh, Rich Dance. Yes, the tie is back in mothballs. You won't see that for another 18 years, I promise you. So I don't want to delay anything because, I, you know, with the two guests I've got this evening, we could do a show with each of them and we could run two hours and it probably still wouldn't be enough time to talk to either one of them. So we want to give these guys as much time. And uh, before I bring them on, yes, Johnny, uh, we have fixed that problem with Captain Mike. He will no longer be sneaking in the high dollar items and pretending he didn't know the instructions. So that is uh, quite true, and I will fix that. It has been fixed. Let's put it that way. So without uh, further ado, let me bring in my guests this evening, Dina Mauricio and West Stefan. Good evening, gentlemen. Hey, Bill. Hey, everyone. Hey, Bill. Hi, Dino. Hey, everyone. Russ, what's going on? Not much. How are you guys doing? Good, good. Hanging in there, guys. It's, uh, you know, four, four nights a week for me is a little bit much, but the thing is, these are so much fun, aren't they? I mean, I, I know you guys have watched a few of the shows, so, you know, you guys, are, you're enjoying them as well. Great show. I've seen every night. show. Oh, yeah, it was terrific. You're like the Academy Awards, just 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 making an honor for the for the whole hobby. And uh, happy birthday to Calf. Really excited to be here with West and really hoping to make a good show for everyone. Well, uh, you guys certainly will. And like you said earlier in the green room, you guys get to kick off the next 18 years. So that's yeah. a special moment. Honor. Right? The heat yeah. is on. <laughs> but thank you, Bill. I mean, what you do for this and putting these together are just so informative. We're just talking with Wes. We wish we had this when we started in the hobby. You know, we had to learn from kind of, you know, scrounging around, getting knowledge everywhere we can. But these these shows, I mean, the, the amount of knowledge and and, uh, and and getting to see the art and talking about all stories, that's just so great for any collector, even the new ones. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's uh it's been it's been great for me too because you know the thing is I've been interacting with so many of you over the years and know your names and I've seen you know met you at shows but I don't you know I don't know a lot about you know you as collectors and you know what drives you to want to own more artwork or you know it just it, it's been completely enjoyable for me to to learn more about the people whom I've just been you know it's been tertiary relationships with people through CAF so I, I, you know like you I wish we had been doing these for the last five or ten years as well. Yeah, it seems like we know names and avatars more than <laughs> Oh, you're the guy voices. with that Thor cover. I didn't know there was a person behind that. I thought it was just a collection. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, exactly. And then you get the story on on you know how you picked up those covers. And you know, and that's 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 the most fun. You know, like I, I really enjoy the show I do with Mike, Will, and Glenn because they've got so many crazy stories, uh, you know, about just picking up art and when they flip it for something else because they really wanted something different or they really thought they were going to keep this one for a long time, but they needed to move it because something better came along. It's, it's that, it's that, you know, the immortal chase for whatever you think is the, a, a grail. Yeah. And I was yeah, just thinking really the other day how lucky we are to be part of a hobby like this. I mean, you know, intrinsically, comic book art, once it's produced, really has no intrinsic worth. So essentially, it's a discarded byproduct, right, of the production of a disposable good. And it's, you know, struggling to find more relevance, these comic books in today's digital world. But this is a collectible that 
makes us all passionate. And some of us will spend a whole life collecting this stuff. And for many, you know, ensure a comfortable retirement. But we're very lucky to have an, a, a hobby like this and a community to, to, to share it with like we have on CAF. Well, I mean, it, I know I, it's funny because I, like I've said many times, you know, I didn't really know what CAF meant to so many people until we started doing these chats. So it's, uh, it's been a really rewarding experience for me. Well, it's been more rewarding on this end, I think. <laughs> That's, Just, that, yeah. You know, being able to, to see all the art and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of new pieces every day and being able to buy stuff and sell stuff and just, you know, meet people and form those relationships. I mean, it's, uh, it's, you know, I'm not on Facebook or any of the other things. So for me, this is it. This is where I get my art fix. Same with me, West. I mean, I just, uh, I let, leave the social media to the kids, but you know, the calf is kind of, I, I like to think that Bill is kind of the Walt Disney, uh, when Dis <laughs> calf is his Disney world and we're all getting to play in it. So, you know, I get to go in a couple, you know, a few minutes a day and it's just one of those great escapes for me uh, that, that I cherish almost every day. Well, I, I really do appreciate hearing that, you know, that trust me because uh, yeah, it, yeah, like I said, calf means a lot of different things to different people. You know, it's whether they're collectors or they're people who are trying to market their, their things, but uh, just the pure joy that I know that, and, and the friendships that have been made through, through calf uh, are the things that are really to me, like the greatest achievements and the things that make me most proud. I'll be perfectly honest. Yeah. You know, Cause I, and those are things I didn't know were really happening. I mean, just, I, you know, I just kind of felt like we were just a big gallery and I was helping people discover art to buy, you know, and it was uh, and that was kind of where it stopped because I always looked at it as a utilitarian, you know, type of thing versus something that could promote friendships and, you know, and shared experiences. And it was all happening. I just didn't know it. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about kind of how Wes and I were both part of a golden age comic collecting forum and community. Um, we can post things and people could say, hey, that's great. Wish we had one. Where'd you get that? But there wasn't really a place to kind of record all those 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 galleries, so to speak. They were just in threads on the CTCC board or just meeting up pe with people at conventions. You kind of get pictures of what they see. I mean, what makes CAF very special is it creates a, a kind of a permanent gallery or at least semi-permanent that, that we can all visit and 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 share with friends and 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 keep track of of our own collections as we progress so uh, that's that's uh, unlike any other hobby I've I've, I've 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 ever seen so no I, I i agree and we can certainly make better tools to help you track your inventories i mean that's that's one of the things that i kind of lament that we haven't put a lot of focus on mm -hmm. is the ability because I, I get asked that a lot. Can I download a, you know, a spreadsheet file so I can have something, you know, later on, you know, for my records? Because people feel like, you know, because they're doing dual entry. They have insurance reasons or or for whatever reason they want to have it. And I don't have an easy way for somebody who spent all this time putting their art on CAF to just export what they have. So, uh, you know, there's I always look at this. I have I have a list of things that I, I wish I could have my wife program for us. So uh, <laughs> but it's, it's just hard to get those kinds of things done. And hey, we got to let Wes show off his T-shirt. That's so cool. Wes, do you want to show? All right. Off? Yeah. Yeah. This is my uh, my 2020, 2021 uh, shirt of how everyone's feeling about these. Years. <laughs> so every time I wear the shirt, which isn't very often, I get comments on it. Well, we we definitely are all feeling that way. <laughs> that's, that's how you feel when you miss out on that on that auction that you waited three weeks to bid on, and you just didn't bid enough, and you just missed out by one one increment, right? You look like you feel like that. <laughs> <laughs> or when you I'm, get beat out by someone on a. Uh, <laughs> I do have my I do have my mask, my my Marvel mask, and Captain America and Spidey and stuff, but. I don't have a T-shirt like Wes. That's that's really cool. No, me neither. I'm I've only got a I've got a David Peterson mouse guard T-shirt on underneath it. So. <laughs> <laughs> He's one of my favorites. I love his work, but uh, but no, it's, uh, it's that is a very appropriate T-shirt. I mean, clearly after the last eight it's months, three and a half months of uh, being cooped up, but we all feel that way. So uh, someone had mentioned earlier that uh, they had met uh, Dino at a comic art con back in 2019. And uh, you had a reprint book of some of your collections. So yeah, you know, I was one of the first one. I started putting together like these uh, 
these artist editions of my collections so I can kind of bring it on the road and and show it off to to, to friends as I as I flip through at their homes or in mine and I don't know it was just a, it was an easier way to, to to share some of my collection and and obviously they outdate every two years so I have to make another one but it's a fun thing to do kind of to, 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 to document and I want to see that again. I'm, I'm, I'm not, yeah. No, so basically, it's a, it's a, it's a 11 by 17. Um, I could fit about 50 pages in, um, you know, pretty good detail, and allows me to kind of just, just, I don't know, create a, a, a portable um, book, coffee table book, something to share. I sometimes used to share copies with, with other friends. I could send them out, but I don't know. It's just a fun thing to. To kind of when I'm on the road and I don't have my collection with me, I can flip through it and and kind of remember the stuff I I picked up. It's no, funny. I used to do that with uh, when I used to collect Golden Age books. I would take a scan of it and I would put it in a three ring binder and I would take the binder to shows and show. <laughs> That's right. And this is back in like the early '90s before all this other stuff. And I actually didn't think to do that with the art because now I just have it all on my phone, but. The phone is really small, but what you did is a, is, uh, is a good idea, definitely. Yeah, judging from the comments, I'd say, yeah, no, I, that's a, that's really, really cool. And the, uh, I'm assuming, did you work with somebody local to print the book? For I did. You know, I, there, there are these on Groupons. You can go, there's, there's a, they're called photo books. And the largest one they make, there's one company with 11 by 17, high quality paper. They put on all your scans. And, and there's some there's some fun in kind of arranging them. I try to let... The uh, Avengers move into Thor, move into into mm -hmm. another D, you know, and 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 try to make them make 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 some, you know, put two together that 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 have common characters or common artists. Um, well, but again, that's uh, as you know, Bill. You always, I'm always trying to find ways to to enjoy the stuff I have, particularly with the, with prices escalating and it's harder to get more of them. You kind of you have to really you know cherish the pieces you have, and and you know, I, I only own one portfolio, right? So everything else is either on the walls or in closets where I can see them. and um, Yeah, I think we might see something about that a little bit later. That's but, right. uh, but yeah, I think when you see another Groupon for that, you need to share it with me and I'll share it with everybody and tell everybody that they should, <laughs> uh, you know, pick up, you know, create their own artist edition of their collections because that's that's a great idea. Happy to share it, happy to share it. Yeah. You know, you, are, you already got an offer on the book. Oh. We're up to ten bucks. I'm dealing with it. <laughs> Jordan, aloha, that. man. So Jordan and I met in Hawaii. We talked comics, I and mean, he's he's out there, and and I was on a trip out there, and and called him up, and and we sat for two hours over beers and talk art, and bought a couple pieces from him, and he's just got an incredible collection. Re really great guy, and uh, I try to say hello every time I'm out in Hawaii. You know, drop by to see him. Wow. I mean, everybody's jealous. I'm jealous. I want to make one. And, you know, the great thing about that is, and, you know, you hear about this so often is that, you know, people can't take their most expensive work to shows, you know, dealers can't. So making a print or, or like you, like you said, Wes, sometimes just having it on your phone is really what you'll end up doing versus transporting the, you know, that artwork. So printing a book like that just guarantees you're never going to lose the artist and not going to get damaged. Um, and what, I mean, I want to do one. Well, I mean, you know, I live in New York and, and I get together with the, some New York collectors and I'm not going to very, I'm not very comfortable carrying like 50 pieces in a, in a backpack or in a big, in a large, in a large uh, sack, you know, into the city to go to when Dan Potick used to have his meetup. So I just found it easy when I'm meeting for lunch or something, I'll just bring a book and we can just talk through things. And uh, it, it's almost like having the collection with me, but I don't have to kind of bring around the individual pieces. So. Right. Well, we won't tell Scott Doonbeer that you've been, you know, making. Oh your no, no, no copyright on that. Is, uh, <laughs> these are all experimental stuff. But I love them. I love. I love putting. It. I think I put. I put. I've done four of them so far, and uh, tried to do a different, different cover for each. Well, it's absolutely beautiful. So, yep, we're we're definitely all jealous. So, uh, we've been. Uh, we kind of skipped over the whole part about you know doing the origin stories and everything. So. I don't know which one of you might like to start off with that. Hey, Wes, why don't you start off? Okay, I'll start off. Um, so I first actually started collecting, collecting comic books when I was 12 years old, and I was a big G.I. Joe fan. And it was, uh, it was my 12th birthday, me and my brother, we went to Toys R Us to spend our birthday money. And we, we get our, uh, our G.I. Joe toys, and we're at the, uh, the checkout. 
my mom's there and she's like, she hands me a bag and in the bag is comic books. And she goes, if I buy these for you, will you read them? I wasn't much of a reader back then. I think a lot of kids my age, you know, you don't really want to read that much because you're more interested in doing other things. And I, I looked at it and the first book I saw was G.I. Joe 23. I flipped it over and then on the other side was G.I. Joe 21. So I was like, yeah, it's G.I. Joe. Of course I want it. So, you know, she bought it for me and I took the, the uh, comics home and I ripped open the bag actually in the car and I got G.I. Joe 21, 22 and 23. I'm like, OK, cool. I'm going to read these on the ride home. And I opened up G.I. Joe 21 and I go to read it and it's like, there's no words. And I'm like, <laughs> what's going on here? How come? Is this like a misprint? And, you know, I see the ads and the ads have words and I'm like, no words in here. I look at the cover again and it's a silent issue. And I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> so then I go to issue 22 and there's words. And I go to 23 and there's words. So I go back to 21 and I read the comic book, which takes like 30 seconds because there's nothing to read. Then I do the, the 22 and the 23. And I see in there that there's a subscription to other titles. And I'm like, mom, can you get me some, some titles for my birthday? She goes, okay, you can have two. I'm like, okay. So I picked GI Joe as the first title that, <clears throat> that I wanted. And I think the second one was, um, it might've been web of Spider-Man, but it might've, no, I can't remember what it was. Um, so I got the, uh, you know, I was getting the, the comics in the, in the mail for about a year. And then, the next year is my birthday again, and I continue to get the GI Joes, and then I think I got Transformers as the uh, um, the other title. And Transformers was really big then, and I was getting both. So then my brother says, "Hey, me and my friend are going to go to a comic book store." I'm like, "What? What comic book store?" And they're like, "Yeah." So you know, I saved up what little money I could, and I started and. Uh, a comic book store, which I ended up going there for like 25 years. Um, all their back issues are behind the counter. So I go up there and I'm like, you know, can I see your uh, back issues of GI Joe? And so I'm flipping back and I needed a, a 24 because the first issue I got in the mail was 25. So I needed a 24 and they didn't have it. So I needed a 24 for the longest time never find an issue of G.I. Joe 24, but I started getting, um, looking at the older issues and I ended up picking up like, I don't know, five or six of them. And I went all the way back to issue three, which has this awesome robot cover. And I was like, wow, this, it was like $6 and 40 cents. I remember the price. Um, cause they used to mark the price on the back of the bag in grease pencil with the grade and the price. So then I'm like, well, let's, you know, so they also had an issue two, flipped it over, and it was like 30 bucks. I can't afford this. I think I, I think I had like 10 bucks on me. And then issue one was like 20 bucks. And I, I didn't know why issue two was more than one, but I was like, I couldn't afford these. So I ended up getting like issue three, five, and a few others. But my brother, who had a paper route, he was he was loaded, man. <laughs> he had like 60 bucks. So he bought issue one and two and four and, you know, he got a whole bunch of them and, you know, I was not as fortunate as he was, but, um, so, um, you know, I got those books. I was also getting books from, uh, from the Seven Eleven cause that was much closer than the comic book store. Um, and so, um, some of the first books that I got from, um, the Seven Eleven were, um, Justice League uh, 227, which had this awesome uh, dragon cover. And I was big into uh, Dungeons and Dragons. So I was like, wow, that's perfect. Um, then I got an issue of ROM. It was number 55 because was, I was like, wow, this is a robot cover. This is cool. I love robots. And then I got the Hulk number 296, which had the Hulk fighting Rom. I was like, oh, okay. I didn't know who Rom was really, but I was like, okay, Hulk's fighting this robot guy, so he must be cool. <laughs> and then the last issue I got was the Thing number 13, which kind of had like a serpent on it, which was kind of like a dragon. So I was like, okay, well, that's neat. 
Um, so then later on, um, I learned about, um, I learned about conventions, um, and I lived in, in the, uh, the LA area. So I would go to the shrine show, which was a monthly show. And there's also a small show in the San Fernando Valley. Um, and so probably by the time I was 16, actually thinking it was even 15, I had amassed a pretty big collection um, and a lot of Silver Age stuff too, because um, my parents were always into antiques and collectibles. And so they kind of, they weren't discouraging me from spending money on comic books because they figured there's probably some value there. Um, so I actually set up at my first uh, show, I, I was like 15 years old and I got a booth and I started selling comic books because um, I was already kind of like transitioning into wanting other things. And I was really getting into Spider-Man and you know, Spider-Man was really like the first thing I started collecting as as a serious collector. Um, and at one point I probably had like 98% of every Spider-Man comic book ever made. So I was pretty close to like having everything. And then I transitioned over to golden age books um, pretty early. I was probably about 17. And I was always a quality collector. I always wanted like something that was like, the best that I could get. Cause I knew that, you know, I knew that quality over quantity was important, you know, not only as a collector, but as an investor and as a kid who's spending like every penny he has on comic books, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't dumping my money into something that I couldn't at least get my money back. So, um, I started collecting, uh, pedigree books, um, mile highs, other pedigrees, because they were the best of the best. And I transitioned from um, getting DC comics, because that was my main thing back in the 90s. Then I kind of sold them all and restarted, started buying Timelies um, and some key issues. Like I had an Action one, a, um, a Captain America one, Marvel Comics one. I was getting a bunch of the keys. Um, and now it's right around 2004, and um, I ended up working for uh, CGC as a grader. Um, I had known Steve Borok for quite a while at that point because he was also into um, expensive DC comics, mile highs, and that. <clears throat> so he kind of he offered me a job. So I moved from California to Florida, and. It was kind of around that time that I kind of got more exposed to art because <clears throat> previous to that, <clears throat> you know, I was seeing all this black and white stuff and I just didn't quite understand it. And I didn't know, I just didn't understand it and there was no one there to teach me it. So I shied away from it and I was always more drawn to colorful stuff like, you know, Schomburg stuff and LB Cole books and, you know, stuff that's, shiny and nice looking. And when I see the black and white stuff, I was, I just, I didn't get it as a younger guy. So when I was at CGC, uh, Borak was really into art at that time. And he had his art all over yeah. the, the grading room. So I was seeing it every day and still actually kind of ignoring it a little bit, but then he got a piece by, um, by Bud Root, this, full color, huge piece of art. And it was beautifully drawn. And I was like, wow, that is like really neat. I was like really drawn to it. And I ended up buying it from him. And I was like, well, I'm going to look for other stuff by Bud because I really like this piece. So he's probably got other pieces that I would like also. So I went online and I found some more pieces that I like, and I started acquiring quite a few of them. And I think I've probably had a total of about 50 of them. Um, and then I started getting into the black and white stuff a little bit more, kind of understanding the, you know, really more what it was about and kind of appreciating the black and white 
aspect of of the art. Um, and when I was a kid, I used to draw a lot. Like I was always drawing like Star Wars stuff and comic book stuff. And the majority of the stuff that I did was black and white. So I kind of like connected on that level and started realizing, yeah, there's a lot of work that goes into just making the black and white art as it is. And um, I also realized, you know, that the majority of the good pieces are in black and white and I can't get like a color piece of art of like something Kirby did because there just isn't anything, you know, because he didn't color his own stuff, you know, for the most part, certainly none of the um, stuff for production. So I really just got more into the, the history of the art itself and really got, just started to get the bug for liking the art. And slowly over the years, I've bought more art and less comics. And um, I think it was around 2006 that I joined CAF and um, put up, uh, you know, started putting up some of the art that I had. Um, and then around 2011, I left CGC and had to sell off a lot of the art. Um, and I had a, a son at that time too. So I was, the bills were coming in. So the art was going out <laughs> <laughs> and like you, Bill, I regret some of the, some of those sales, but I was at least grateful that the, that the art was there for me to sell. And I was nervous because I didn't, I was just buying and buying. I didn't know if I was making the right decisions, you know, and it was like, okay, how much money am I going to lose here? Um, Cause some of the art I'd had a while and some of it I had just bought months prior. So I went through CAF and um, had a lot of Bud Root art. So I was like, okay, I'm going to email like everybody who has Bud Root art on <laughs> see if they would Corner want to buy market. another piece. And sure enough, I sold about half the stuff that way. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and I had other stuff other than Bud Root. And I, so like I might've had like uh, like a world's finest comic or whatnot, you know, a cover. And so I would just use your site to find people who had similar things and offer it to them. And I did really well that way. And um, I didn't lose money on, on one single thing. And I made money on almost everything. So I was like, wow, I, either I got really damn lucky or maybe I know what I'm doing just a little bit. Even though no one taught me, I was like, I was just flying by the seat of my pants. And so like Dina was saying earlier, it's like there was no one there to teach me. And, you know, I would ask people like Borak, you know, his opinion of stuff and, you know, a few other people, but at the end of the day, it was my money. It was my decision. And it's like, you know, when I was buying the stuff at the time, I, I just figured I'd probably keep the stuff like forever. And when that didn't happen, I was like, okay, well, let's see how this goes. And like I said, it turned out really well. So uh, in 2014, um, Steve Borak and I started CBCS, which is another grading company. And once I had a steady paycheck again and some, some money in the bank, I was like, okay, well, it's time to start buying some more art. <laughs> mm -hmm. Had the bug. Um, you still have your timelies, Wes? Most of them are gone. Um, so a lot of that went into um, buying some art um, and a few houses here and there. Good, good. <laughs> oh, so, um, so again, I was grateful that to have the comics and the art. Um, but now, you know, I've been in this business for a long time. I'm 48. And, you know, I started when I was 12 and seriously collecting when I was about 15. So, you know, being a grader for the two companies and seeing the comic books come in, seeing how much stuff is really out there and grading like one to four copies of AF15 like every day, <laughs> you start to get a little jaded and it's like, yeah. it's cool when an action one would come in and I could grade that because that doesn't come in every day, but. Like just an action one, just. 
Yeah. But I've probably graded like 5,000 copies of Hulk 181. <laughs> It's just yeah, another Hulk one West is being humble. I mean, his timely collection, his his CGC avatar was timely, and his timely collection was just, I mean, monumental. What you've touched and, and the mile highs that you've that been through your your collection, West. I don't think anyone has touched uh, that number of quality books. Um, well, I have you know a few people to thank. Um, one of the guys that you know just dumb luck was that. Um, John Verzel happened to be in LA yeah. and like the main guy for mile highs. And I learned a lot of stuff from him, especially early on. And um, that kind of really helped me going as far as yeah. having an access to actually buy those books. Cause even just finding them was like difficult. Um, but another thing that that kind of helped me with too, is like, mile highs are one of a kind. There's only one for every issue, just the same as, as art. So good training I, ground for, yeah. When I was putting together a mile high run of say action comics, there's only one. So if someone said, Hey, I, I don't want to sell you my mile high copy of action 50 or whatever, I couldn't just go to the next guy and say, Hey, I want to buy your copy because there was only one copy. So um, Will you tell Steve, like when I when I was still going between comics and art, I ran into him at some convention and he, I was like, oh, I got to meet the comics grader from CGC. And all he <laughs> wanted to talk about was art. I'm like, you know, what about these Detective 20? No, no, no. Let me tell you about the art and art. And I just thought, you know what? Here's the here's the guy that's associated with the CGC comics grading service. And all he wants to do is talk about another hobby. So I was just. I was very intrigued when I started seeing that, but you tell him that uh, I couldn't get yeah. him to talk about comics. He was so into <laughs> art. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of the same way too. I mean, I, I love talking comics and I always will, but just being in it every day is like a business now. It, it's probably like, you know, when you own your own comic book store, it's like, yeah, you probably start getting maybe a little bit jaded and it's like, okay, it's just like, is this another day at the comic book store? And, and that's kind of the way it is with grading. It's like, it's kind of fun to, because you never know what's in the next box is to, you know, you open up the box and, you know, what's going to be in there. Is it going to be a, a Hulk 181? Is it going to be an action one, a spawn one? I mean, it, you know, you just never know. Um, and in a way I kind of feel like I'm looking at like everybody's collection and it's, it's kind of like my collection for like a minute while I'm grading it because, you know, I'm the one that's owning, it, yeah. you know, doing all the work and, and, grading it and looking through it and, you know, handling it. And it's, you know, it's, a, it's an honor that people trust me, A, not to damage their book, but they value my opinion and Steve's opinion on the grade of the book. And that's, it's really important. Good. Well, we're glad you came over to the dark side, Wes. This is a <laughs> much better hobby for you. But that's, Bill, that's why it made sense for Wes and I to team up because we both have that golden age uh, collecting root in our past but uh let me i'll i'll take you through my origin story so um bill i'm i was born in 1968 like you so when wes is talking about being 58 i kind of jealous 48 about, uh, 48 yeah I'm, 48. Je I'm jealous but born in 68 uh raised in nashville during the 70s and 80s and i, I just loved comics like like a lot of folks here um not just reading and collecting but the whole comics culture that was evolving at the time you know the toys pajamas the Bed sheets, the 7-Eleven Slurpee cups, Wes, you know, beside the spinner racks, there was these icy Slurpee cups with all the Marvel characters, Saturday morning oh, yeah. cartoons like Spidey and Super Friends. And I just happened in Nashville to have a fantastic local comic store, The Great Escape, which is my handle on uh, on, on CGC. And Great Escape is kind of my escape to my hobbies. But it was like Grand Central to me growing up for collecting back issues and hanging out with my friends. And early on, you know, I sort of focused on kind of the Marvel and DC issues with any notations in the Overstreet Price Guide, right? Origin and first appearances, key battles, major storylines, a great artist. I think they broke out Neil Adams, Starlin, Byrne, Perez, uh, Barry Windsor Smith. Uh, so this that remains really a core element in my art collecting today. I remember when I, when I was seven or eight, I, I bought a, a stack including X-Men 1, Fantastic Four 3, Journey into Mystery 89, 
And I just, I thought I'd gone to heaven. I mean, I was buying, I was seeing collect, uh, seeing books that I could just only dream about. And there they were in front of my, in front of my, on, in my hands. And I, I just, I got the bug really early on. I started buying kind of as many back issues as I can with my dollar fifty weekly and now allowance and lawnmower money. Um, by 1997 or something, I, I, I'd, I'd collected all the kind of S, Silver Age, Marvel, and DC keys. Um, I wasn't as fastidious in terms of grade uh, for, as Wes, but I was kind of getting nice, solid copies that were very readable, but I'd put them away in, 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 my, sent, my, in my bags to kind of keep them in great shape. Um, I actually turned to Golden Age. I, I love the thought of buying books that were older than my dad. Um, I had first got into, when I first got into comics, um, you know, I got the the uh, the, uh, the 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 action one, the factory stuff, the big treasury edition, the big large size things, and and one of the things that that got me in the golden age was was really the history behind it, the 1940s, the the curb, the old uh, timely comics, and over the next decade, I think I, I I assembled what I would argue is one of the better collections of gold of classic covers and flag covers. So I love the. Uh, the classic covers, the ones that had those memorable images. I think I listed, I, I found, a, I created a list of 332 classic covers, either designated by you guys at CGC or Overstreet Price Guide, or sometimes I just made it up because I figured, hey, this is a classic that everyone like, likes to collect. So I, I tried to, I collected all of them. And I put together a, a collection of just classic covers uh, and flag covers. I thought there was a lot of patriotism in those. A lot of overlap between the two, uh, but they were they were these highly coveted issues that that were iconic and memorable, and they spanned all from superhero to to crime to good girl to fantasy sci-fi, sci etc. And they had a, a lot of scarcity. And what was interesting is that they just I found a strong reluctance for owners to part with them, which kind of was a good training ground for me going into OA, you know, into uh, uh, original art, uh, which I got into around 2004. Um, started buying on eBay and conventions and, and really got introduced from some of the crossover dealers like Bachara and Brian Schuster from Neat Stuff. I think I bought a couple of pieces from Hans K from Tri-State. Saul Zimmerman were some of the early purchases that I make. And, uh, and, and I noticed also they were in the back end of the heritage comic, of the catalogs. I mean, now it's all, I think art's usually the first two, two sessions. But back when I was, you know, 2004, it was always golden age first. And then the, the art was in the back and I, I, but I, I, I stood around and I, I picked up a couple of pieces. So by 2008, I think I had uh, collected around 40 pieces, mostly 70s and 80s title splashes. I love the large central images. Um, I really gravitated towards New York type covers. So here's an example of, of a Teen Titan piece, New York background that, that really, I, I think, shows off the, the, the city. Um, um, I think it was one of the things that I, I didn't really consider myself a OA collector, but I did like the display and, and, and I like the, the, the title splashes because you get the, the title, which shows the issue number and the indicia in the bottom for cataloging and really for authenticity. I, I, I could tell that it was authentic because it had those stats on there. Um, and I got a few paintings, I believe Joe Jusco and Alex Ross, uh, which has always, always been a favorite of mine. Um, and, and I started, I, I really enjoyed those pieces and, and I, I still have about a half, about a dozen of those still, but the rest of them I kind of gave away or sold away as I was building my collection. I, I joined CAF in 2009, really encouraged and inspired by some of the fellow collectors. I mean, Harry Nadu, uh, uh, Bill Wu, uh, Vinny Zerzolo at Metropolis, Mike Davis and Ken Rogers. I mean, they had this, this great collection going on, passing great pages between the two. And I tried to, to, to skim one or two off over time. Uh, Greg Starr, who also is a big uh, West, if you remember him from the Golden Age uh, boards, he came over to art about a couple of years before I did. And it was just, it was just a different collecting experience for me. And I, I was just, it was full time, it was full speed ahead. I think after around 2009, uh, 2011, I, I sold off my comic, uh, the class, I was selling off my classic covers, you know, through CGC over the years. And in 2011, I put it all on Heritage and, and, and they, they, they put the whole kind of classic cover collection on display and sold that off. So I could put that into art and it's been, it's been art ever since. And I'm really grateful for being part of uh, this hobby. And CAF really helped me connect with 
just a number of folks who are obviously much more experienced with collections that could that can learn from. And, and through CAF, I've, I've made countless friends that I value today and, 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 and gathered some you know, nice OE treasures along the way. Um, but I, uh, I, I really am passionate about art. I, I think it, it really embodies a lot of things that I like. I, I think some of the, my other hobbies collecting were like um, uh, autograph letters. So I, I was a big collector of manuscripts from famous historical figures like Napoleon and Einstein and, and, uh, and uh, Darwin. Uh, I like the fact that they were handwritten letters with their autograph. But looking at comic art, if you think about the process of putting these artists who are my Mac Michelangelo's and, and Da Vinci's, right? They're, they're actually crafting the page with their own hand and their own ink. And, and whether some of whether they have a signature on it or not, they're they're putting their their life's work into that uh, into that page. And so there's a very similarity there with 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 the uh, the autograph letters, a lot of authenticity. I, I agree with West, the whole one of a kind thing was just really intoxicating for me. I mean, I, I, I actually thought some of my classic covers being one of five issues, I thought that was pretty, pretty hot, but uh, nothing compares to owning a, something that, that's, that's very unique and one of a kind. So um, that's how I got to in, into CAF and into art. And I've, you know, I've been uh, re really fortunate to, to have met a lot of folks through Bill, Bill through, through CAF and, 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 and continue to, to learn about these new collectors. I mean, I, I, I met uh, Mikhail, one of your previous guests the other day who has gone what I like to call zero to 60 in like half a year. Um, yeah. Before it to get to 60 pieces, West and I could tell you it took four or five years of of just you know learning and figuring out what you like and 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 even getting access to some of those private deals through 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 people on CAF was just it took time. And nowadays you get all that knowledge through programs like this. And I, and I think new newcomers do have a, a a bigger bigger advantage than than we did when we started. So. Um, I, I uh, again, that, that's my origin story. Uh, I'm, I, I'm still evolving. I'm still 52 years young, and, and I'll be collecting this until I'm uh, old enough. Uh, until I'm kind of in a wheelchair, and I'm enjoying my my art as a in my in my retirement. So, no, that's great. And the uh, one thing I would point out, it's kind of funny, is that yes, I would say Steve Barack has gotten a lot of people interested in comic art over the years. So that's yeah. uh, you know, we, I've known that for a long time. But the one thing that uh, that uh, actually, you know, West had mentioned in it, and I've never really heard it described like that before, was the idea of collecting pedigree comics as being something like you got that one, you know, you can only get the mile high 50 for action comics. And that that I never really thought of comic book collecting in the same way as original art collecting. But that idea that, there, that at least in comics, there's that one opportunity to get the only copy of a pedigree, you know, that uh, so that, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, which of course the pedigree copies sell for two, three, four, five times normal copies because it has that that history, right? That uh, that that provenance. Where whereas art could have the same thing. I mean, one of the suggestions that I'll have for your site would be to kind of have a provenance button where if you see a piece that you've owned before, you can click it, and the owner of that piece can kind of know all the prior owners because there's some value in knowing. You know, there's four or five people that that I respect that used to own this piece. It, it kind of gives me a better feeling about kind of my taste in that in that piece and and the shared history that goes beyond just you know folks who live comments or who who collect similar types of artists or, or titles. But having that piece to kind of celebrate the, the the provenance and stewardship over time, I think would be pretty powerful. No, I agree. That's that like, wouldn't be a bad feature. The question would be is do you make it public or is it only knowledgeable to the person who owns it uh so there'd be some things to finesse True. hey and, and i do want to mention one thing west i'm catching a little feedback when i when on your mic so i'm muting your mic every once in a while just so you know that i don't know if you can hear the same thing dino but i can kind no, of I... hear it. okay well that's good then if i'm the only one hearing it then i'm not worried about it i won't mute your mic anymore <laughs> uh, sometimes I think as the producer, I, I get like a couple different uh, channels that come in audio wise. So I kind of hear a couple different things. So as long as nobody else is hearing it, that's perfect. Um, so uh, would you like to talk about some, some of the artwork from your collections or did you want to? Absolutely. 
All right. And, and again, I, I, anybody on who's joining us for the episode, if there's any questions that Wes and I can answer, this is this is for you guys as well. So I definitely want to uh, open that up for any any questions as we as we go through our pieces. Okay. So a couple other people do hear it. Uh, so what I would say, Wes, maybe you know, lower my volume. Well, yeah. you know, that might be what you need to do, because. What's happening is as our audio is going out your speakers, your mic is picking it up and sending it back as if you're talking. So we're kind of hearing ourselves a second delayed. So I mean, is this a little bit better? Because I just lowered it a little bit. Much better, much better. Yeah, I'm not hearing it now. So that was probably what it was. It was just too loud. And it, so it was probably bouncing off the wall behind you. <laughs> we needed to put you in a soundproof room. Hey, yeah. Great. All right, good. That's perfect. So. Uh, why don't I go in here and uh, let me see. We'll start off with uh, you, Dino. Okay. And Happy to. to oh, so um, you know, this is my trifecta page. Uh, this is my favorite image of my favorite character, Wolverine, drawn by my favorite ar artist, Frank Miller. Um, I just love the detailed portrait of Wolverine. I think it really captures a lot. You know, the classic Miller lines that he brought to this uh, limited series. Um, it's actually part of the climactic scene where Logan proclaims his humanity, saying kind of, I'm not man, I'm not a man, but a beast. I, I, I'm a man, not a beast. And it, I think, reflects his central character, which I guess gets into kind of the content of, of the page. I mean, I, I, the, the details of, of the portrait are just fascinating for me. I heard from Joe Rubenstein that when they did the Wolverine number one cover, they couldn't really get his face right. They didn't get the lighting. And I just think that they were able to, as the end page to number three in 1990, 1982, uh, they were able to really define what Logan would look like. And yeah, so he's out of he's out of costume, but it never really, it never really, no other image really captured to me what Wolverine was about than, than, than this one. Um, I really like the fact that if you know the story of Chris Claremont and Frank Miller uh, driving back from San Diego Comic Con to LA, they're stuck, stuck in a car and, and, and Claremont asks to do a, a Wolverine solo story with Miller and Miller was kind of not sure. He's like, well, you know, Wolverine is just a attack dog that's used to spice up a lot of the X-Men team dynamics. and. Uh, Miller said, yeah, it's one dimension or one dimensional. And, and I think through that, he and Miller got together and crafted this Wolverine story uh, that really echoes the whole Logan loses everything and gets rebuilt in a new image where he's part animal, but emphasizing his humanity, uh, character and conflict to himself. I just think that this just kind of captures it for me. And I was, I was really thrilled to kind of uh, get this early on in my in my collecting. It was actually owned by two previous uh, two 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 friends of mine, uh, Ken Rogers and Harry Nadu, who both uh, who have collections that that I, I admire uh, today. And uh, you know, one of the things that that I loved about it was uh, for me, it was just it was a it was a one and, it was a one and done piece. It was something that was memorable that could really capture for me whether it was framed on my wall or kind of sitting. Uh, in in my hands, the, you know what Wolverine was all about, and I, I love the short story. And I thought it was one that if you went for eight issues, I would be kind of reading it all. But uh, it was it was very um, uh, moving to me as a, as a reader, and really set the foundation for my kind of love of of, of the character and and his evolution through through Marvel over the years. Uh, yeah, I would say that the uh, also the the main image of Wolverine. It's it's you really got like a cover quality image of him, so you definitely did good with that piece. I like it. And, and, and you could, I've actually, you know, when I told you I, I focused on splashes. One of the things I really thought were really cool were these end splashes, right? The, when it, when when it kind of sets the 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 the, the teaser for the next. Um, the next uh, the next issue, I think the artists and the writers can really try to make something very impactful. And, and I've, I've really, you know, when I, when, I, when I saw this page when I was reading it, I was really on, on edge and waiting for that next month's issue to come about was torture. Um, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm really thrilled to have this. And this is probably one of those uh, proverbial last pieces that I'll ever let go. I don't blame you at all. This would be a uh you know, one of the, my favorite pieces in my collection, if I own that. I, I've uh, I've never owned an artwork by Frank Miller. And uh, Me neither. 
it's a hole in my collection that one day I will fill, but I don't know with what, because it probably won't be a Wolverine page and it probably won't be a Daredevil page at this point, but it'll be something because I've always had a great appreciation for his work. And, and this was like, this was, you know, one of the best stories, you know, that I, about Wolverine, you know, that I've ever read. And, you know, for me, the, the story that I, when this book came out, I had seen uh, Byrne and, and Miller both at a, uh, uh, Mid Ohio Con, and it and it was funny. Even back then, it was like everybody was still flocking around Burn, and nobody was at Miller's table. And it was during this peak, you know, period for me when you know his stuff was just incredible. And it was it was odd how he didn't get the same attention uh, from art collectors and fans, even though he was doing such incredible work back then. Thank you. So let me. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna go back and forth. So I'm gonna pull a piece from West here. All right, that is um, Silver Surfer Annual 7, page 16. It's by Scott Eaton and Tom Christopher. Um, I've always been a really big uh, Galactus fan, and there's just something very um, it's very powerful about him, obviously. I mean, he's he tears above everybody 99.9% .9 of the time, and he just demands your respect and he gets it and when i saw this piece come up for sale i you know it was, a, it was a little bit pricey but i was like you know this you know if this were a cover it would be like 10 times as much <laughs> definitely uh, <laughs> you know it's the detail is there and, and you got um his herald there who's um i forget who he's uh he's gotten his hands there but uh he's um, you know, I think at the bottom, Galactus is basically saying, you know, just get rid of them. So um, it just kind of shows you the a little bit of the heartlessness of Galactus too, and how he's just he's all business. He's got no time for uh, emotion or lesser things getting in his way. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Yeah, I'm a big Galactus fan too, and I have one of my pieces with Galactus and Super Server. I mean, that those two have been, you know, we've been lucky to see the the, the, the Kirby's and the limbs and the uh, the Burns. Uh, just a lot of the greatest artists really have their hand at those two. The, the, the you know the the Galactus and his Herald. Uh, it just it just makes for dreams in terms of comic stories. That's a great page. Uh, so this was my uh, this was my first Marvel comic, uh, not regular size comic, but I, I remember buying this off uh, when I was buying those Treasury editions. So this is the uh, uh, Marvel Treasury Edition number three Thor cover. Um, it's really an iconic, uh, majestic, and inspiring image uh, from John Romita Sr. Um, again, it's just a one and done Thor cover for me. Uh, it, it was it was really uh, uh, early when when um, at the time Romita just just been named art director at Marvel in 1973, I believe, year before. And he really tried to reinvent or re recast all the key Marvel characters in these gorgeous and iconic looks to kind of really inspire the the, the Marvel licensing that were, was happening at the time. And so I remember he did uh, four of the first seven uh, Marvel Treasury editions. I think he did uh, Hulk, Thor, Spidey, and FF, and then they threw in BDO, uh, Barry Windsor Smith Conan, Brunzer, Do Brunner, Doctor Strange, and Kirby Avengers, uh, but just created for me when I was reading these as a kid, just the the, the look and feel of, of, of what the comic uh, heroes were for me in the 70s. Uh, what I love about this cover is that it just shows him in, in, in full flight with his hammer. Uh, gold, you see the, the, the rainbow bridge and Asgard, um, it's got these things called the power lines or rays. I seem to have a lot of pieces that have a lot of those. I, I tend to like that a lot. Um, but again, it's just it's a, it's an image I could just stare uh, stare at forever. Um, the, the the problem with having a cover like this is I've passed up so many other Thor covers over the years because I just couldn't I couldn't get myself to, to to buy have two because I you know I had so many other needs at the time. But uh, you know when I I, I did acquire this. Uh, through CAF, through Andrew Van Ebden, a, a collector from down under in Australia. Um, he was actually a huge Daredevil fan. And as he was building his collection, he kind of had to get rid of 
things that didn't fit. And so this was a misfit in his collection. And, and, and uh, I, I've been lucky over the years to pick up a lot of quote misfit pieces when collectors are, are trying to narrow their focus as prices escalate. And uh, I made a deal with Andrew and uh, he sold me the cover and I was just, uh, I was really, really happy to get it. Hey, Dino, what's the size of that one? Is that a standard size? It's um, it's it's fairly size. I have that on my wall here. Um, it it, it is standard size. Um, it's eleven by seventeen, full bleed though. It goes all the way to the edges, um, which is kind of nice. Now, was that a piece that was promoted for sale on CAF, or was something that you had maybe? No, used no. I you know, uh, he, uh, Andrew and I had had we were big Daredevil fans at the time. He was getting far more of a share of the Daredevil art than I was. Um, but uh, no, we, we, we just, we, we did a trade. I think I, I sent him an, a, a Daredevil. I think I had a Frank Miller kind of panel page that, that, that was, went his way and I, and I got the Thor cover. Nothing wrong with that. Again, misfits are good. Misfits are, I mean, <laughs> I, I would never go to, uh, you know, uh, uh, West is a huge Spidey fan. You know, I don't go to West looking for his Spidey pieces. I go to West looking at things that he may want to get. In fact, I, I think I, I we we did a trade a few week a few months ago where I gave him a a, a Spider Man X Men piece and he gave me a Thor cover. So we yeah. kind of we kind of got to 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 help each other well. out. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I like your misfits though. <laughs> <laughs> I want some. <laughs> All right, let's uh, look at another one here. This 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 image is a little risque, so if the kids are around, you okay, might want to yeah. have it's, them move it's out. Of nine, it's 10 o'clock, so we're okay. That's right, that's right. They should all be in bed by now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, as you can see, that is a uh, kind of a cover recreation of, of sorts of Action One, uh, kind of blending in the, the golden age that I like with the Bud Root art that I also like. Um, I actually came up with this concept and I talked to Bud Root's um, manager, uh, art manager, um, Kevin, and is probably going to butcher his last name. I think it's Aesop. Um, but I, I kind of drew a rough, a rough sketch and idea of what I wanted. And I said, you know, I want a woman lifting up a car like Superman is in action one, but instead of smashing the car on a rock, I want <laughs> smashing it on a T-Rex's head. And I want Marion's hair flowing back nice. and cape. And instead of having people running, I want to have a bunch of velociraptors scattering. <laughs> so he said, okay, yeah, I'll do that. And it was, um, for the time, it was quite an expensive commission uh, and he said, yeah, you know, we'll get it done in about, you know, six months, maybe eight months. Well, it took almost three years. And so this was like the first and still only the only commission I've ever done. And part of me was wondering, you know, okay, <laughs> am I ever going to get this piece? And <laughs> finally came in and, you know, Bud Root was very gracious about it and, he even said, you know, thanks for not suing me, kind of as a joke, because he knew he was way late on it. Uh, but the nice thing was, is that um, it was supposed to be, you know, your standard 11 by 17, um, but because it was late, he drew it as um, a 19 by 24 piece. Wow. So it's like two feet tall of nothing but And you know, the, the scan really doesn't do it justice, but the detail that he put into this and, and the coloring is, um, it's just, it's amazing. And you can, you can tell he put a lot into it, Wes, but most of the uh, Bud Root backgrounds are very sparse. And this one, he went in full detail. He went all out. And you can see that he signed it Bud 2011, but I actually commissioned it in 2008. <laughs> um, like I said, I was, I was happy to get it and, um, um, Kevin actually sent me a, a scan of it before I got it. And when I saw it, I was like, wow, that's like, it's amazing. And then to get it like two weeks later and seeing it in person is just like, wow, it was worth the wait. So, um, big props to Bud. Um, he just needs to be a little bit faster and <laughs> <laughs> short of that. I mean, it, he knocked it out of the park big time.
And that's, uh, as a commission, it ended up being published more than once, right? So that's an added bonus for something like that. Yeah. Um, about a year and a half ago, Kevin emails me and he goes, hey, uh, you know, Bud wants to turn this into a, a cover, but I don't have a scan. Can you send me one? And have a, a scan that was good enough. But he's like, oh, actually, I have the one that I sent you, you know, back in 2011. So I'm just going to use that. I'm like, oh, okay. Didn't really think anything of it. And then just like a few months back, I, I came across that email again. And I'm like, hey, Kevin, did that, that book actually ever come out? And he goes, oh, yeah, it came out a year ago. And here, I'll send you a copy. <laughs> so even on his dime, he sent me, you know, a, a copy of the book. And I was like, wow, you know, that's, you know, that's awesome. Ten years later, he's published a free comic book. <laughs> But I was like, yeah, you know, that's awesome. This this commission that that I th thought of that Bud drew, it turned into something. And it's like, that's my only, my one and only um, artistic outlay of any sort. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's definitely every art collector's dream when they commission an artist that the, the piece will eventually become a published piece, whether it's a cover or a pinup in a book or it becomes a print. Uh, you know, you're you're very fortunate when you when you do that and then it turns into something that uh, you can actually say was published. I mean, it just Absolutely. changes changes the value and everybody's appreciation of the art, I think, becomes a little bit different when they when they know that it was uh, turned into something published. Ah, so this is the Rights and Swamp Thing, uh, issue two, page two from 1972. I, I love all white rights and swamp thing pages everyone's a treasure i really love the exceptional beauty and technical brilliance of Wrightson's work um you know it's only 10 issues i remember going through and and seeing this page and wondering if it ever came up to market i would love to own it it's an origin page something that fits the, you know a lot of what i have or you know I, I gravitate to a lot of the origin recaps um this one came up in 2017 i had the swamp thing five orange origin page at the time but when this came up i had to jump for it and, and i you could see from the different panels and i'll take you through a quick panel breakdown on why i love this page so much so uh top panel is you get everything you got the big face from the, from the swamp thing one had a big splash that you can see on the left it was echoed in the top panel you, you see the uh the the, the 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 laboratory instruments there lush backgrounds and then you see the explosion in panel two which echoes the 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 origin page bottom left um again just just how he kind of transforms into another being um the third panel is him coming out of the swamp it echoes the the swamp thing nine cover owned by steve fischler um one of the best covers out there but just i i, I thought the similarity of the image really really spoke to me as a collector. Um, panel four, when you look at, um, you know, Swamp Thing and, 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 and uh, his, uh, his, 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 his wife, Linda, just the, 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 the sorrow and the, the powerful emotions coming out of there are, are, are just portrayed brilliantly by Wrights. And, and finally, the, the, the panel five is, uh, kind of reminds me of the, the saga, the Swamp Thing cover, the wraparound cover, owned by Zadok here, and he's a collector here in the, in the New York area, but it kind of brings to mind that image of that 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 revenge being taken in the forest that uh, that was part of the story uh, in, in the first issue. So uh, it's a panel page. It just has a portfolio of panels that I think speak very well to the story and to the character of Swamp Thing. And again, you, you, it's hard to top what Wrightson brought to the to his uh, his 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 uh, his most noted work. And um, you know, I'm just uh, I look at this and I just I, I just I, I just can can revisit my my uh, my love for the, the, the story and the, and the art when I was reading it uh, uh, way back when. That's a, it, you know, that's that's a perfect piece for you. I can I can tell. You know, I mean, it's a, it's, you know, that's I, if I could own a rights and swamp thing as well, any page would be, you know, just fine. But that one is, you know, it's beautiful. One, yeah. So let me uh, see here. But uh, and uh, and you know, the thing was, we actually saw that uh, that one swamp thing cover on uh, when we when I did the interview with Zerzolo. Yeah. As he walked through his offices, he kind of paused on that one. So. Yeah, that was nice. I got to get to him to do something like that again, but where we can actually look at things a little bit in more detail. He needs a calf cave, uh, Bill. I'll talk more about that later. Yes, he does. Absolutely. 
I noticed that today someone else posted a Swamp Thing cover by Wright. The number four cover, yeah, Crane. Yeah. Uh, just beauty. It's a beauty. Yeah, absolutely. I'm jealous. <laughs> Crane's collection is just, you know, you could you could ogle it all day long, <laughs> right? Yeah, I, th I think I even put in his, uh, his um, a comment that, that he already won the best of for this year. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Game over. <laughs> Funny. Um, so this is another uh, piece that again kind of goes back to the the golden age collector of me because this is obviously the uh, cover swipe to Detective Number Thirty One. Classic cover. Classic cover. <laughs> um, and this is by uh, Matt Wagner. <clears throat> I saw this on CAF um, when the other owner had it. Um, maybe two, two and a half years ago, I think. And I just told him, I was like, if you ever decide to sell this, I'm interested. And not long ago, he's like, Hey, something else has come up and I'm going to let it go. Are you still interested? And I'm like, well, heck yeah. <laughs> and, um, I was like, well, what do you want for it? And I was expecting like some crazy, crazy price. And he goes, well, I'll give it to you for what I paid for it. And when he told me the, the amount, I was like, wow, done deal. I mean, <laughs> this is one of the few pieces where I actually felt like it was undervalued, at least in my opinion. So um, to me, this is like the best piece of art that's come out in like 20 years. Because for me, this hits every um, everything that I would want in a... Um, in a modern piece of art. Um, and then of course, you know, of the, the Neil Adams version and yeah. 27 yeah, man. is unaffordable. And, you know, I'm sure the cover to detective 31 doesn't even exist, but Neil Adams, Batman version of this. I mean, I don't even know how much that would go for, but yeah. honestly, I think I like this even better. Um, and again, seeing it in person and seeing the wash tones that he did, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's perfect. It is to me as well, the, 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 the ultimate uh, Wagner piece. I mean, it has everything you'd want in kind of the Batman imagery. Um, and again, with the, with the connection to Detective 31, it just adds some own personal value. And anytime you get a piece that you have some personal value that's, that's unique in it, I think that's always a, it's always a great win. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I absolutely love Wagner's work. And I did want to, I saw a question I wanted to highlight, and I, I kind of skipped it over, but this was uh, when we were looking at the Bud Root piece from, uh, so John Norton asks, it, you know, in the case of, the artists owning the re reproduction rights and can they be negotiated? They absolutely can. If you want to pay yeah. the artists for their reproduction rights, when you commission them, you're more than welcome to, but you probably won't want to, uh, to do that because it would cost a lot of money. The artists <laughs> want to, you know, they hold their, their, their copyright on the work that they produce and they can do anything they want with it. They don't need to get your permission. I mean, unless you purchase it. So, so yeah, that's usually not something, most com people who get commissions take the time or effort to do unless they're unless they, they want to reproduce it you know because then they can do anything you know you that they want with it after they have it so um yeah just that does not happen too often and you're welcome. so let me get uh over to this next piece a great piece Wes. Uh, yeah, absolutely thank you well, here's another great piece. <laughs> oh, okay. So Marvel's 25th anniversary, which by the way, they're celebrating their 60th anniversary today, or this year, uh, by Cary Gamble. I think a lot of people when I was growing up had this poster on their walls. 1986 is when I graduated from high school. I was in the kind of peak of my reading. And this is when a lot of the great storylines, Watchmen, Dark Knight, all that was coming to the forefront. And, uh, you know, this was one that that this poster, which is is uh, the art itself is 34 by 22. So think of three twice up boards side by side. It really contains, I think, 70 characters here from Avengers X to X Factor to Fantastic Four. It's got a lot of unique uh, elements that are distinctively 1986, like the bearded Thor, 
uh, punk rock rogue, uh, the Mohawk hair and Storm, uh, Silver Centurion, uh, Iron Man flying up there, and I guess Sue Storm with short hair. And you know, so if, you, if you're like me and love the 80s, this is kind of absolute nirvana. Um, and when this came to market, it was just one that was just top of my list to have. I, I sort of love things with, with a lot of characters, and I couldn't imagine something with, with, with more characters in detail uh, that, that, that could be put on a page. Um, so again, the, the poster art, I had the poster growing up, and I just, I, I just love the fact and, and, and really humbled to, to own the art. Um, and as a kind of personal piece for this, if you can pan back to me, Bill, I, I took this art and through Kinko's and Photoshop, I made when my when my wife and I celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary, I made a kind of a, a poster of Maxine and Dino's marvelous 25th anniversary. And I presented <laughs> this along with her present. Uh, for for our anniversary, and I kind of you know she she's very supportive as uh, with me in this hobby, and and I thought it'd be nice to kind of present something uh, to celebrate our 25th. Uh, as 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 uh, excited as I was when when I was celebrating Marvel's 25th, so um, kind of got to bring in some personal content uh, from the hobby. But again, you know Marvel. That was 1986, so in 2021, they're celebrating their 60th anniversary. If you, if you kind of fast forward from uh, 1961 when they introduced uh, Fantastic Four, um, so there could be some celebrations in order. But you know, when I see that poster, I'm just harking back to high school and, and, and comics and, and, uh, and, and reading and just, just loving the stories that were coming out of the, out of the, the, the Marvel house at that time. Yeah, definitely. I, I love those pieces that Marvel puts together, like the Michael Golden, uh, Mary Marvel Marching Society or whatever it's called. And because it, it captures the characters in a particular time, like you're saying, period. Yeah. The, the Thor Thor image there, you could tell that was the brown costume Wolverine. You know what I mean? It's I, I love those and the short hair suit or, you know, Sue Storm. That's that that just makes those uh, so special because um, nobody, you know, Marvel does some goofy costume changes, you know, as they have, I mean, I'm the same, I was born in 68 as well, Dino. So it's, that's the same period for me, you know, the eighties is like a sweet spot for me. So seeing that image, uh, I was really happy you picked that one out of your catalog. Yeah, I'm no, glad to, and, and I will put that, uh, it's not in my gallery at the moment, but at some point I'll put it there. Did uh, I notice that, that um, they put the, uh, the, the black costume on Spider-Man too. Yeah. You know, he had just come out and uh, I think with super, super, uh, Super uh, uh, Secret Wars, and and it was all the rage. Uh, Spidey 252 came out, and I guess for the next three years they wanted to juice him up. So black spider, black black uh, black costume Spider Man became the rage. Mm -hmm. And uh, George asks if you have it framed. Oh, you know, I have wanted to have it framed, but it's just so big. I mean, it's it is huge. I when you go to a framer and and they they measure it and they say it's going to be you know. It's a lot of glass, for example. So at some point, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, I have limited wall space. Uh, it makes me try to kind of uh, pick and choose what goes on my wall. But I'd love to get. I actually wanted to to get, to get that in 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 a you know, frame, but I just haven't have haven't had the haven't had the opportunity. But at some point, I will. And I will I will show George the frame before anyone. How's that? <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Well, <clears throat> this is. Um, Amazing Spider-Man number one, but not the one from 1963. Um, this was the um, the giveaway that they did, I believe it was 1980, and it is by um, Ramita and inked by Sinnott. And I've always been a huge Sinnott fan. I think he's by far and away the best inker Marvel ever had. Um, I don't know how often he inked um, Ramita, um, especially on Spider-Man, it's probably not too often, but, um, you know, this were from the regular, you know, Spider-Man title. I mean, the, the value of this would be through the roof. And quite frankly, I probably couldn't have afforded it, but um, it's still a, a Marvel number one from the 80s. Um, and it's, again, it's got everything that I love. You know, I, I'm, I'm really drawn to action. Um, sequences and, and um, you know, battle pages and, and something other than just people kind of standing around and talking or whatever. That doesn't excite me as much as, you know, seeing the action that's happening and, you know, wondering, okay, what's, 
you know, what would this image look like, you know, three seconds later? Is he, is he going to knock him out? Is he going to miss? I mean, what's going to happen? This is so cool. Um, so it kind of gets the creative juices flowing for me a little bit more, just kind of seeing the action pages and kind of, you know, wondering in my own mind, you know, how, you know, especially on the cover, you know, how is this going to end? How is this going to um, work out for Spider-Man or for the Green Goblin? It's such a terrific <laughs> cover, Wes. I mean, if you think about yeah, all the awesome. stuff going on here with the Green Goblin and Spidey swinging, and it's a number one cover. It's 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 remitted its best, and it's a period cover. It's not like within the last five years. It's 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 back in the day, and it just it has everything you'd want in a uh, in a Ramita, uh, uh cover image, right? Um, very lucky to have that one, huh? Yeah, I, I can't imagine one that I would like any more than this one. I mean, there's lots of them that are worth a lot more, but to me, this is, this hits like all the boxes for me. So I'm happy. Now, any, anything with Ramita and you've got Spider-Man and Goblin. <laughs> Amazing. That's perfect. Let's see here. Let me get this over to there. Now, uh, I should ask, Jason asked a question, and I, I think this was something that we had put on our topic list, and uh, he asks, uh, Dino, not sure if you if you missed this or not, but uh, why do you not have everything on CAF? And, I, and, I, and you're, you're right, I, I, the Gamble piece, I think because I was looking at that PDF you had sent me and the images, I just kept, and I, and I was looking at your gallery, it just all made me think that it was <laughs> in your gallery, but, but it wasn't. So, so why, as a collector, uh, and you both could probably answer this is, you know, do you not show everything on calf? I think, you know, a lot of people have their different reasons, but what, what are yours? Well, well, quickly, I mean, these are very personal pieces to me. I have about 45% of my, four, half my stuff on calf. Um, you know, I used to, back in the day before the like button, I used to send thank yous to people who leave comments. And uh, so it took a while. And if I had five pieces listed on there, it would just it'd be too much for me. So I'd, I'd, I'd space them out one at a time. I try, I try to t typically post on Sundays, but also as auctions became more competitive, I'd go through auctions and not come away with anything. And, and to kind of make me feel better, I'd be able to pull out something from my from my unlisted stuff and, and present it to share with Kath. You know, I think uh, for me, it's it's one that deserve each piece deserves its own time in the sun. So I, I want to give it the attention it deserves. It allows me to curate almost like a museum curator and and the curator is responsible for purchasing, but it's also responsible for going back and and selecting pieces that would be uh, appropriate and advantageous to the to the display uh, and, and to share with others. So I kind of like that role and, and I, I kind of keep an inventory what I call for the dry season. You know, when 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 I'm older and I'm not able to to add to my collection, I'll have I'll, I'll remain active on CAF, hopefully drawing from some of my inventory that I can share. Um, and then finally, you know, I, I, I do get get together with collectors all the time, either in my home or theirs. And and I like pulling out things that they haven't seen before. And that's kind of some of the enjoyment that, that they do for me and I, I do for them. So. Yeah. And actually, all, all my stuff is on CAF. Um, so um, the, the one person's CAF page that I go to the most is my own. And for me, it's, it's just easy to look at my stuff that way and, and appreciate it, you know, because not all my stuff is on a wall. In fact, most of it is not. Um, you know, I, I do have a few pieces framed and a few pieces on the wall here and there. Um, but, um, you know, also, I, I know a lot of people are, you know, keep talking about this, you know, to market aspect, which mm. I don't know if I agree with or not. Um, but, you know, I feel that, you know, the, the artwork is, was made to be viewed, not to be hidden away. So um, I've always been pretty forthright and forthcoming with the stuff that I've owned and, um, you know, just wanted to share it because I think that's part of the enjoyment of owning it. Um, is to share it and um, it'd be kind of like owning a Lamborghini that is in your garage that you never drive. It just sits there and you look at it every once in a while and then put the cover back on and you, you know, you, you got to have some enjoyment with it. Otherwise, what's the point of having it? 
So, you know, it's, you know, if you can't display it, I think you should at least be able to, to show it and, you know, show your friends and, and, you know, get people interested in it because, you know, that's what art is all about is, is, you know, invoking an interest in, you know, the subject of the art. Mm -hmm. No doubt. No doubt. Um, yeah. Bill, maybe this is a good time to kind of introduce the quick video. I, I kind of put together just the background. I mean, I do have pieces that I enjoy, as Wes said, not in a portfolio, just on my walls or things that I can I can really look at. And what I wanted to build was something where I can can literally be enveloped by art, like 50 pieces around that I could just just close the door and 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 really enjoy my art, whether they're listed in CAF or not. It's something that that really helps me take a break from my day and. And uh, so I, I prepared a quick video of, uh, of, of, of what I call my calf cave, um, just devoted to art. There's no furniture, just art. Bill? All right, here we I go. I did that for... <laughs> that one, but again, I I miss seeing people and getting together with people, so I I thought I'd put it on video to share with everyone here today. Oh yeah, yeah. Jordan, Jordan wants to know what's the admission charge. <laughs> so so to to West analogy, yeah, Lamborghinis are are okay sometimes driving uh, by yourself, but uh, you know obviously uh, I and I I really wanted to have a place where I could just enjoy art and not have uh, not have any distractions. So it's a nice getaway for me. I want to know how you actually have had an empty closet that you could use. Cause I, I had to fight my right. wife for that. No, I, I, I told her I was going to clean up. Right. So I took away a whole bunch of boxes and storage stuff there and, and I got to the empty closet and I thought, you know what I want, I want to create, you know, and, and yes, I've seen on calf great wall art. I mean, Nick Catridis has 40 pictures of wall art. I don't even have 40 walls in my house. <laughs> um, but I thought it would be cool to have one little place where I could kind of be a, a cocoon of art, right? And, I, and they're all on on rails, so I can interchange pieces and and, and have it as I as my collection uh, grows. But uh, for that room, it's only dedicated to art and nothing else. No, I love awesome. <laughs> now the uh, you know my thoughts on, on you know on that is and I, I like your your concept not not just of the room but when you were mentioning before we showed the video about the idea that you know you're curating your own gallery versus always showing everything and it's something that i always wanted to add a, a feature on calf where people could like curate regular shows from other people's collections it's kind of oh, the, there, we, there's always that favorite kind of concept but it's not something formal where i could say you know, uh, West. Uh, you know, why don't you curate a you know a great Steve Ditko show or something like that? For, that we it's a virtual show out of all the pieces you know that are out on CAF, and we show that. And then, or Dino, maybe you're going to pick some of your favorite pieces from the '80s, and then that would be something that would run along because totally yeah. it would give us the opportunity to focus in on segments of the hobby that you know that the CAF can't really do on its own. There's no, there's no what's you know West favorite, you know, Spidey pieces or Dino's favorite pieces from the 80s. But if we did some kind of a guest curator type of thing and made exhibits on CAF. I think that would be a great idea. I mean, Wes and I could pick a dozen kind of homages to Golden Age <laughs> covers and and that would be a terrific thing to view together. So uh, exactly. So it's it, that's something that I've always wanted to do. And it would be a feature I'd love to have because I, I, I do. I think it, that everybody has something that they're really knowledgeable about or passionate about. 
and it's not always all of it in your collections. Usually, hardly any of it is, right? But you, you, you right. know, be able to. It's, it's just like the best of from the other day. It's we're celebrating the hobby in, in different ways, and I think if, if we were to build that feature into CAF, I think I probably would have a lot of people that would like to curate their own shows. Definitely. One more thing for the want list. Ah, that's right. Never end. Put that on there. Yes, exactly. And uh, and my wife and daughter keep reminding me to remind everybody that if you're liking what we do, always subscribe to our YouTube channel. Sorry to sorry that plug, but I got to give it there. They they'll get mad at me afterwards. But um, I I think that uh, let's see where was it? Everyone should make a video of their displays. So you know that's what we were hoping for, right? Do you know that we would? Yeah. It becomes like it's a new the, it's the new medium, right? This is an omni-channel CF CF experience, right? Exactly, and. Uh, and you know, one of the things that we've I've not really ever explored too much about in user profiles. I mean, I don't even allow you to put like people who do have social presences, like be able to link to your Facebook or whatever. Right. But uh, but the idea after you showed me that, Dino, was I, I thought, wow, it would be kind of cool if we allowed you to embed one uh, YouTube video into your uh, calf profile. And if it, for you, you know, if it's showing off your collection, if somebody else, I mean, got you know, who knows what it might be as long as it's you know appropriate. It would it would be a good thing to have on CAF. It's just another way to engage people who visit your CAF gallery to to learn a little bit more about you and your collection. I'm all for that, yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And and uh, Harry likes the idea of curated uh, displays. I think so. That's something that I'll definitely consider for 2021. I, I I do think that back in the day, I remember asking some people about it. Hey, would you do this or that? And People are always kind of wishy-washy, and so I was like, "Well, I don't want to. I don't want to have Maureen spend a couple hours programming something that I might only get one person to use a year, you know." But if we actually had a base of people that would love to do that, I, I'd be all for it. I think you'd get a lot of people that would be interested in that. I do agree. I agree. So let me uh, let's see. We were talking about that piece last. So let me go over to. Well, this was a prize winner from last evening. So. Honored to, and thank you for all the votes uh, who did. Um, so this is the end page, another end page to uh, Electro Assassin number six, uh, uh, Bil Bilson Kevich, 1986. Um, you know, very simple image. It's it's Electra and Garrett, who's the alcoholic shield agent that that becomes obsessed with Electra. Um, what I like about it are the colors. Um, uh, this the heart shaped bed kind of reminds me of the cover of uh, Electro Assassin 4 with the heart and the kind of imagery of the cherubs and the angels. But this is so much cooler, I think, with all the ammo and gun guns blaring um, and the size, which is Electro's weapon of choice. Uh, they're, they're having a quiet moment. Um, the only dialogue on the page, I think, is Garrett saying, you know, we don't talk much anymore. And it's it's just <laughs> seeing this image was just it's it's just again it's a cliffhanger. You kind of want to know what's what's going to come out to the next next um next next issue. Um, Bill Sulkevich, when he did Electric Assassin, really changed the game. I think forever. He took what was normally a cover quality painted illustration, and he decided to do a an eight issue graphic novel uh, using those same techniques. He added a lot of of uh, abstractism and the fact that it was written by Frank Miller. Some say that the entire story is kind of a, a you know getting wired into Frank Miller's brain because he got to really experiment with a lot of different types of action and storytelling. And uh, anyway, it was a it was a very memorable story. And um, I've always wanted to get a page from this uh, this um, this this series. And you know, I've seen a number of them come up, come about and. I just, I just, when this one came about, when this came to market, I, I, I thought I, I, I would just have to get it. This came from a, 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 a European collector, uh, Alex B, who just, who amassed some great pieces in his. Uh, he still has a great, great collection. Um, he was uh, ready to part with it because he bought another ben, Bill Sukevich uh, painted piece, a much larger uh, one with Daredevil and, and Electra, and he had to let this one go and. Um, you know, I was glad that he uh, he came to me uh, with the opportunity, and uh, I've I've always felt like this was the the piece that perfectly captured that book and that character uh, and the artist uh, for me. Yeah, it's absolutely beautiful, and uh, probably one of my favorite periods for Sinkevich's work. And like you said, it was like every page was like a cover, and they were just so beautifully done. Okay, um, so this is the cover to 
Amazing Spider-Man 82. And um, again, I never thought I would own, you know, a, a Spider-Man cover under 100 because, I mean, there's less than 100 of them to, uh, that are in existence. And to, to get one, and um, again, it's another action-packed cover that um, draws my attention and that, you know, there's... I think I counted one time how many people are running around in the audience and it's, there's quite a few people there. And again, there's just like so much detail to this. Um, and it's, um, it's by Marie Severin and, um, um, Ramita. Um, and, um, I know that initially there was another cover that was done that I guess got lost in the mail or something. So they had to, Kind of rush through and do this one quicker so there's more um marie severin than there is ramita on this but um you know i think that they knocked it out of the park on this and it's uh you know i'm just over the moon to have it i mean there's nothing else and we talk about grails a ramita sub 100 spidey cover with a a major villain right electro is in electro is in one of the spidey movies um it's just it's just jaw-dropping just to see and and hold right because i i love the fact that you know when you talk to the dealers that are on your calf live bill with you know berkey and and will and 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 Glenn, they always talk about kind of their the, the, the spidey covers that they that they got when they were started collecting as the as the ultimate grail. Um, and I know a, a couple of collectors with with spidey Romita spidey covers, and I um, mean it's 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 the uh, it's the ultimate piece, and 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 deservedly so. Yeah, I was, I was always attracted to um, you know the the villain aspect of you know who's who's the superhero fighting. Yeah. You know, back when I was collecting Golden Age, one of my main things, I was collecting Joker covers and Penguin covers and all the villain covers. Um, even with Superman, I was collecting the Lex Luthor stuff and um, even the, the kind of zanier guys like the prankster, <laughs> mix it click. Um, so to me, getting a piece where the, the main superhero is fighting a villain, it's... Uh, doesn't get much better than that for me. I don't blame you. It's a, it's it's fabulous, and and I agree. You know, the the villains in Spider Man were as good as Spider Man in most. Rogue movies. Gallery was unparalleled. Right. Uh, Absolutely. Oh, so this is a recent post for me, and um, uh, a recent acquisition actually. This is the the. Uh, 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 Gibbons Watchmen page from uh, number six, which uh, which tells the origin of my favorite character of the series, R Rorschach. Um, it's really one of the most grisly and memorable scenes from this Alan Moore uh, novel. Um, you know, I, I, I've had a couple of other pages in the past. Um, I, I was really uh, cap enraptured by kind of Rorschach and his history and the grittiness of, of, of him as a, as a uh, vigilante, right? Uh, a moral, morally questionable vigilante. So what you have here are nine panels in, in classic Gibbons fashion, um, Rorschach in uniform or his trench coat. Um, this is after he discovers that a, a six-year-old girl has been killed and fed to two German shepherds. So he takes his cleaver and and when he strikes one of the dogs, he he uh, he, he exclaims how the blood splatter kind of reminds him of the of the uh, Rorschach ink splot or the ink ink blot, uh, which became his namesake. Um, if you read some of the words on the page, he talks about uh, when he closed when he opened when he closed his eyes, he was Walter Kovacs, the 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 the, the man. Uh, but when he opened his eyes, it, he was Rorschach. And this scene and this event uh, transformed his views on the world and 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 really became uh, uh, Rorschach as he was was to be famous. So what I love about the page, a very simple graphics, um, but it has Rorschach has the ink blot. It has the um, uh, Walter Kovacs talking with a psychologist. Um, this came up at auction, as you know, uh, earlier this year. And it was just it's one of those four to five pages that you rem I remember from that novel, knowing if it, if it ever came up uh, and available, I would um, I'd be very interested in, in, in going after it. And I was very lucky to get it. 
Yeah, that was one of the pieces we featured in, uh, I think, one of the heritage recaps we did. So congratulations on that. That was a great page. Yeah, the, those pages don't come out very often, do they? They don't come around, it seems like. No, they, you know, they all, yeah, everyone always looks back and say everything you always want today uh, used to come around a lot more <laughs> a long time ago. But, uh, you know, watching pages were, were always very scarce, um, you know, but, um, but fortunately, they're, 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 they are, uh, they're, they're, once they're in your collection, they're, they're ones that you could share with others and, and relive kind of that just great storyline. Um, and for me, it's uh, it was one of those pages that that really stood out and in and, and and very memorable. And that that's what it means is trying to get something that that can elicit and and remind you of a of a storyline that you love. And uh, that did it for me. Um, I, just a, it's a trivia for those out there that Gibbons lettering on the Watchmen. He did his own lettering. Uh, they used that as the template for the Comic Sans font in 1994. That's so when true. you use that on the on the uh, on your computer, just remember it's Dave Gibbons, and it's watching. <laughs> yeah. So and there's actually a font by Comic Craft called Gibbons, and it's really really close to uh, his lettering in Watchmen. It's okay. I've always wanted to buy it, but I thought I'll never have a use for it. But I, I I don't know. I love fonts, so that was that's one that I've I've always wanted to pick up. Okay. Here is another. Mm. Piece by Bud Root. Um, it is um, Batman and the villains, and in total, there's 13 figures on this piece. Um, it is actually four feet long and 19 inches tall, so it's wow. 48 inches. Um, and kind of the way this thing was created was. Um, apparently, Bud Root had promised to sell somebody an entire. Cave Woman uh, uh, issue, and I guess he had also promised that issue to somebody else, and the guy had already paid him. So Bud's like, "Well, let me just make something for you that you know that I know you're going to want." And somehow this came about, and when the guy got this, he's like, "Okay, yeah, I'll take this because it's, uh, I guess, in his opinion, it was better than." getting all the pages from that cave woman issue. Um, so this has poison ivy in there. It's got scarecrow, uh, Riddler, penguin, two face, woman Grundy's back there behind. Mm -hmm. It might be kind of hard to see. Um, then you got Nightwing, Harley Quinn, Joker, Batgirl, Batman, uh, Mr. Freeze, and then Catwoman. Um, and this, um, uh, on comic art fans, this has over 22,000 views. So um, it seems to be a fan favorite. And um, again, seeing this in person and just seeing how massive it is, um, it's not framed and I can, I can only imagine the cost of having this frame. <laughs> so um, it is not framed, but um, it's, it's um, one of the pieces that I that I really cherish, and um, as a, as a Batman fan, and again, you know, collecting Joker covers back when I was in my twenties, um, and all the villain covers that I that I had mentioned. This again hits that spot of having all the you know most of the uh, the rogue villains there in, on on one piece. That's beautiful. So it's. At, at four feet, uh, how do you score it today? Um, well, it, it is in two pieces. It's on right. two cardboards that are 19 by 24, so it does fold in half. Um, that allows him to put it in his Lamborghini. <laughs> if only. <laughs> is it one board, West, or is it? Uh, you said it folds, but is it a single board? No, or is it's it taped. Two boards. It's two boards that are taped together. Yeah. Wow. Got it. Well, and 22,000 views on CAF is pretty good. Uh, that's so, amazing. Yeah. One of the, I've always thought that uh, we don't really do a lot of stat work, um, you know, like being able to say, check out Bud Root and then order it by, you know, views during different periods. So that would be something cool for us to add at some point would be to see that. And also uh, just like overall 
like views in a gallery. It's not public information, but I don't know if you guys look at the dashboard, but we have that kind of information out there that kind of gives you stat coverage on how many views and comments and things your overall uh, gallery. Well, it's, it's interesting because I actually looked today and I think uh, it's like maybe the, the top 15 um, um, viewed items on my comic art friends. I think 14 of them were Bud Root. <laughs> Yeah, and if we has, know the things that are in in Wes's gallery, it's, that's surprising. There's some things in there that, uh, I, you know, I, I, if I had one view, I, I wouldn't be able to take my eyes off them. But uh, yeah, yeah. Well, one of the Bud Root pieces actually has fifty two thousand views, and I was like, <laughs> I don't know who's who's viewing these, but well, you know, that's it. It. it's the miracle of Pinterest, and you know, people yeah. hear stuff, and and there probably isn't a lot of uh, gallery sites out there with Bud's work on it. So anybody who's a fan of his work and if they, uh, you know, I bet if you went to Google and did a few searches on him, you would find that uh, your artwork would probably be coming up. On, no doubt. You know, but that's, that's the power yeah. of being around for 18 years too, is we, 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 uh, we rank really high for a lot of different keyword searches. So we, th that's why we have so much traffic at the end of the day where, you know, you, there's not many searches where we're not the first one or two, when you type Bud Root, uh, you know, cave woman or something, <laughs> where we're going to be right there one way or another. Okay, so um, again, another Miller Miller written storyline, Daredevil Man Without Fear. Uh, this is the end splash to the final fourth issue uh, by John Romita Jr., 1994. It's a twice up DPS. It's the only page in the whole uh, story where he appears in costume. Um, and he was, it's inked by Al Williamson, which uh, Romita Jr. will tell you. He just threw that out when he said he wants to work with this. They wanted Marvel. He came off X-Men and Marvel said, you got to do this with Frank. He was excited. He said, who do you want inking you? He just threw out uh, Al Williamson. And they said, we're going to get him for you. And, and he was just uh, uh, very, very thrilled to work together. Anyway, this this is a uh, the end page where where he puts the costume on, and and of course he's blind, so he says, and God only knows what it looks like. But you can see the the the, the other images of Daredevil's costume as it evolved uh, throughout the years. It's got that great New York landscape with the water tower and typical uh, uh, um, uh, Miller fashion. There's a great poster. There's a great ad there. I think for Apple movers in the background, which is another kind of tribute to to uh, to, to New York. Anyway, th this is above my desk here uh, as I as I'm looking and I'm participating in this episode in this in this interview. Um, it's one of my favorite pieces. It's it's um, it's twice up. So it's a DPS, but it's, you know, whatever twice up scale. Uh, so it frames beautifully. And, and I just think it's the it's the largest and most beautiful image of daredevil that uh that i can recall in that period and um i'm really 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 again uh just thrilled and blessed every time i see it well if you hung it over your desk that's the piece yeah. you want to see every day right <laughs> yes and like wes you discover like this was used as the trade paperback cover it's been used on t-shirts and art prints and posters and uh when you do look at john ramita's uh documentary on youtube he's got that piece where you know he's got a the page opened up to this page. So it's just, it's just, it means everything to me to have a piece that, that represents the artist and the character that, that, that he loved drawing. And um, so uh, it's, you know, and I picked that up, uh, you know, uh, quite early in my, my club, about 2012, I believe. And, uh, um, you know, I just, uh, I, I continue to read, reread that story almost every other year. Uh, it's, a, it's a great one. That's a great piece. Yeah, Williamson you know, was an amazing inker to to have him pick for that because I, he, they, they he didn't think they would get it, but they, they did. They did. And uh, yeah, all, we're all the better for it. Absolutely. Okay, so here's um, G.I. Joe number 32. Um, again, I mentioned earlier that, you know, the first comic books I read as a kid were G.I. Joe. Um, so this again hits that nostalgic spot for me um and then you know, of course i played with all the toys and um you know uh, the um the dreadnoughts they were in the the cartoons and um 
again, it's it's just a, a great cover that uh, was done by F uh, Frank Springer. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I tried to find a, a Mike Zek cover, but those are extremely pricey in, in this number range. They just keep going for more and more. So um, this one is a little bit more affordable and um, again, it just hits that nostalgic spot for me. It's a, you know, it's a fun GI Joe cover from the eighties and, um, you know, just brings me back to when I was a 12 year old kid, you know, waiting for the mailman to bring me the next, uh, issue of GI Joe in the mail and seeing the, uh, the, that month's adventures. Now, when, uh, uh when you pick up that one, uh, the uh, pack of comics, you know, that your mom got for you. Did you ever tell her that there was a silent issue in there and there was nothing to read whatsoever? Um, I don't remember if I said that or not. <laughs> I, I might've figured that one out on my own and I didn't want to ask my mom about it because <laughs> she probably wouldn't have known anyways. So um, I probably just figured, okay, it says silent issue. So I guess no one's talking in this in this issue and that's just the way it is. Right, it's, it's uh, ironic, uh, you know, because we wanted you to, you know, pick, would you read these? I'll buy them for you. And then, you know, you get an issue. So I just thought that was very- But that great. meant you just focus on the art, right? Without words, you could really focus on how it was drawn and the, the sequencing of the images. Yeah, and I think that's kind of one of the reasons why as a comic book collector and a art collector, I've always been more interested in the art aspect than the story aspect. Mm -hmm. Because to me, I'm more of a visual person. And I guess I get more out of the comic books looking at them than I do reading them. And maybe it's because the first comic book I ever read, I couldn't read. <laughs> I don't know. Wow, so this is... Um... Uh, 1990, who's who in the DC universe, Brian Ballin, front and back cover. Um, you know, they did in 1990, which is when I, I uh, graduated from college, um, DC issued a 16 lim issue limited series reference guide, so to speak, on all the major characters. Uh, Perez, Byrne, Ballin, uh, were all doing characters that they, uh, they, they love to draw. And they, they made these in this uh, loose leaf format. Uh, which allowed collectors to put them in a binder. And this art was created to be the wraparound cover of the, the of that limited binder. Um, what I really like about it, obviously, you know, Balin's one, this is my only Balin piece. Um, it has kind of like the, the Bud Root piece that, that, that Wes put up. It just has everything you'd want in, in, in character inclusion. You have Joker, Great Engine Joker and, and Batman in the foreground. Uh, you have heroes and villains all in a scene that looks like out of New York. So you see on the superheroes are kind of floating in front of um, the United Nations building and uh, the, the villains, uh, Grog and Sinestro and, uh, and others, they're in front of uh, a Diamond K supermarket, which is a chain that was out in Brooklyn. Uh, you see the, I think the Twin Towers or large New York Towers in the background. Um, so again, just a, just a great scene, a lot of good characters. Um, you know, just, just for me, Boland is, is known for uh, Joker and Batman. Now, obviously, he's Killing Joke and some of his great detective covers uh, featured Batman. Um, you know, I wanted a piece that, that, that had those characters. I remember, and I, I know people will laugh at me, but this is right after I sold my Dark Knight page. And uh, this, was, this came from a, 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 a CAF uh, a member, Jared Simmons, who has more ball in Batman than anyone, anyone could ever uh, want. And uh, he, he let this piece go. Um, but it was important for me not, you know, to make sure I, I, was, I was getting a piece that, that, that had staying power. So I called up my, my CAF friends in, uh, in Chicago, uh, Chris Chiara and, uh, and Chris Kalaki, Ron Sonenthal, and, and I got their views. And, and that's what makes CAF very easy to kind of reach out and say, hey, guys, what, what do you think of this piece, price point? Uh, does it have the right kind of characteristics that are representative of the artist? And uh, and I got some good feedback, and I went ahead and with the deal, and 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 really happy to kind of have kept this in my collection. That's a beauty, and and Chris is definitely you know a person I would you know ask any ball and related question about. I mean, he's yeah, he's the, he's a master. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, so this is the cover of um, Justice League of America number 227. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, really one of the first comic books I got was um, at the Spinner Rack at the 7-Eleven. And um, I was big into Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> what more could you want than, than this cover? Um, so aside from those three GI Joes that I got at the uh, at the Toys R Us that weekend, I went to the Seven Eleven, and this was literally the I guess the fourth comic book that I ever uh, that I ever got. And um, when this came up for sale, I was like, well, again, it was a little bit pricey, but I was like, if I don't get it now, I'll probably never get it. So. Um, I took the leap and um, have no regrets. It's uh, <clears throat> again, it's just an action packed cover that, you know, I can stare at and, and just keep looking at it and seeing all the different details of the dragon and um, all the heroes um, in the background and even the other dragons that are way off in the background. It's just, uh, to me, it's, it's a beautiful piece and um, it was done by um, Chuck Patton and uh, Romeo Tangal. Gorgeous. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's, uh, you know, I was a big D&D fan as well. So I always gr kind of gravitated to uh, the stories with dragons and Conan and those and those sorts of stories back in the day. So now this is this is a good one. Speaking about action pack team covers. So this is fantastic for 219, 1980, Bill Sakevich. Um, you know, it's, I think it's a great cover. Uh, uh, it's inked by Sinat, which Joe uh, Sinat, which really gives some depth to the inks. Um, you, you look at the cover and you see him battling this Atlantean behemoth whale coming out of the grounds of New York City with all the Fantastic Four in action. And you even have Prince Namer up at the top. And when I saw this, it wasn't billed as such at the auction, but I, I, to me, just represented the same feel as the Fantastic Four number one cover. So you can see it's it's a monster coming out, and you see the Fantastic Four kind of marshalling their resources together to fight it. Um, so to me, it adds some extra value because of that homage, and and whether it was intended or not, it's just a uh, it, it it brings that same uh, 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 imagery in my mind. And so this is. Uh, the first of six Sienkiewicz covers in, on FF during what we call the middle years, kind of post Jack Kirby, before John Byrne, where they experimented with a number of different artists. Um, I think he got to really experiment, you know, with his his, his action and his depth and his uh, character involvement. What I love about this cover, sort of like what Wes said, is it's got all the four full team uh, using their powers, um, and it's got just action every single space on the cover. It's in fact, it looks like you can't even see the, the four lettering in the Fantastic Four. There's so much action on the page. So I love, I love covers like that, and certainly ticked a lot of boxes when it came to market. Yeah, it's definitely an, an homage to Fantastic Four number one. It's not quite a swipe, but it's definitely got those elements of FF one with the huge monster and. Um, you know, the Fantastic Four, you know, you know, trying to fight the monster. Yeah. And it's, I think, uh, you know, Sienkiewicz did this in a way that as a tryout and, you know, a year later, they put him on Moon Knight one and, and the rest is history. So but a good, good mid period piece for Fantastic Four and um, oh, just a good, good, solid action pack cover. For sure. Right. I didn't even notice a Mariner on it when I first looked at it. He's small, but he's in there somewhere. Oh, that's great. I mean, that was, that's, that's a perk for that one. Okay, so this is a bit of an unusual piece. Um, this was actually done by Edgar Church, and probably a lot of people are saying, well, who's Edgar Church? Um, so he is the artist who, back in the 30s through the 50s, uh, assembled the Mile High Collection by buying one of every comic book ever printed from basically 1937 until 19, roughly 53. Um, so he kept all the comic books and um, the reason he bought them was because he was an artist, uh, mainly working for the telephone company. 
and he would do ads for the different businesses that wanted to advertise in the local telephone book um, in the uh, Colorado, um, Denver area. So um, <clears throat> there's not a whole lot of Edgar Church's art that exists. Um, this one was actually made um, in 1910. And Edgar Church was born in 1888. So um, that just kind of gives you an idea of how old he was when he um, when he made this piece. Um, you know, he was only uh, 22 years old. And, um, you know, the Wright br brothers flew in, in 1903. So, <laughs> you know, seven years later, uh, he came up with this idea and... To my knowledge, this is the only science fiction piece of art um, of Edgar Church's that has survived. Uh, the majority of the art that's still around is the advertisement stuff that he did for the phone book. Um, there are a number of paintings that, um, that still exist. Um, probably somewhere between 50 and 100, I, I would guesstimate. Um, but like I said, of all the ones that I've seen, this is the only science fiction one that um, that I've come across. Well, it's such a great tie to your profession, right? With through CGC and and CBCS and your your love for comics, that you were able to get a piece of art from the gentleman who assembled, you know, the Mile High Collection. I mean, that's that's absolutely amazing. And when, when I when I saw this piece, you know, in your in the list of pieces that you wanted to show, I, I was like, I, I hadn't seen it before. And I think, I think it's just fabulous. I, I love pieces that have historical significance or just, you know, and just the fact that his tie to something that, you know, was really one of the most eventful comic book collections in history. You know, it's amazing that you own a piece of art from him. And the Mile High comics were celebrated because he owned them. That's actually a piece that he drew with his own hands and presented. I mean, that's, that's uh, next level, huh, Wes? Yeah, I was excited to, uh, to get it. And, um, you know, I didn't even know that any of his art had survived. And then a couple pieces came up for sale and me and a friend of mine, we, we bought them and we're like, wow, well, you know, we each have one, I think he had two and I'm like, well, I guess that's it, you know? And, um, I was just glad to have one. And then later on, some more pieces came out. Um, there probably a couple hundred pieces came out in total. And, and that was one of the ones that came out. And I was like, well, this one is extra special. So I definitely want to make sure I get it. Yeah, very good. Right. Very cool. So I think this is my final piece. You can see this is hanging on the wall behind me. So this is um, a DPS from Alex Ross in Marvel's number three. Um, and this is where Silver Surfer and, you know, and Galactus are, are, are coming to turn. I mean, they, they, this is where Silver Surfer enters the fray with a Fantastic Four below, you know, trying to uh, make sense of this Galactus creature coming to uh, to, to, to their to their, their the, the earth and as you know uh, uh, Marvels was one that was told from the standbys perspective so you have a lot of um, uh, of scenes of normal people and what they're doing so while this Armageddon's going on with Galactus and fighting the Silver Surfer and the Fantastic Four you can see on the right you know some guy you know giving all his money away another uh, Sheldon Shelby who's the who's the protagonist seeing a church where everyone's kind of turning religious uh, during this time. And, and the bottom panel on the right is kind of a reflection of old pe older gentlemen who are cruising around in a car and, and they're just seeing this, this, this superhero battle take place in front of them and really can't uh, understand what it means. So um, anyway, this is a, this is an entire painted uh, 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 graphic novel, I think there was uh, uh, four books at the time, but um, this this was one of the few DPSs that had uh, Galactus and Silver Surfer in them. And I think the colors, the orange and the and the fire of, of, of brimstone around Galactus really jumped out at me. And, and again, the scenes of, of, of what people do when they know the end is coming. Um, 
uh, I thought was very interesting. So I have this framed. I've had this uh, really in my office for at least the past 10 years uh, and, and really look to it as a, as a good piece from Alex Ross's majesty as a, as a painter and a, a storyteller uh, as, he, as he did for Marvels and Justice and Kingdom Come and so many other covers uh, since, since he uh, broke into the scene with this, with this book. I love it. It's a, you know, it's a beautiful piece. And, and uh, you know, the Marvel's work was kind of a, like a, a really important uh, book for me as well. I mean, I, I just loved everything about it when it, when it came out. And, uh, and that was the thing that really, you know, I always liked Alex Ross's work, but it was the Marvel story that really made me incredibly appreciate the, you know, the, the detail that he puts into the, to the pieces. So congratulations on it. Yeah. Yeah, any Alex Ross and you can is see amazing. It. You can see it right behind me on the wall. Just uh, I can I can enjoy it anytime I I, I have a, a break from work. Yeah, to have a Galactus um, Alex Ross piece is really special. That's that's an amazing piece. Thank you. Um, so I think this might be the last ones uh, for me as well. Um, so. Um, this is one of um, two pages that I have from House of Secrets number 92, which is um, the first appearance of uh, Swamp Thing by Bernie Wrightson. Um, you can see um, on the third panel that that is um, um, Louise Simons in there and she uh, modeled for the picture and um, Bernie wrote, uh, you know, drew her into the story and in fact, um, several people are uh, artists are, are drawn into the story. I, I believe Kaluta is also there as well. Um, so there's both the pages together and they're consecutive pages. Um, so the first page on the left is um, really the origin page of Swamp Thing um, and how um, I believe his name is Damien or Damon. I think it's Damien. Um, was jealous of the relationship between um, between the two and was plotting his demise of him. And um, he created an explosion that, that blew him up. And, um, but what he did is um, you, know, you can see all the chemicals and stuff there. And then in the third panel, he's dragging them off to the swamp and um, on the story pages, it says that, eventually was able to uh, marry her and make her uh, his wife. But then he realizes that um, she's kind of onto him a little bit and she knows something is not right. So now he wants to kill her because he'd rather be a free man than uh, be thrown in, in jail for, um, for um, Alex's murder. So um, on the second page, you can see on the fourth panel that's, that's Swamp Thing's eye there. And if you look in there, you can see um, um, an image of uh, what's about to happen with um, him trying to murder her. And in the last panel, you can see he's holding a uh, hypodermic needle and he's, he's about to um, kill her. And in the background, you can see Swamp Thing looking through the window. It's kind of hard to see in this image, but you can just kind of see like the look of despair on his eyes, like, oh no, like, oh, he's gonna kill her. And then in the next page, he busts through the window and, and stops the murder from happening. But um, the, um, the light and darkness that uh, Wrightson used and um, just the way he, um, the way he formulated the, the panels and just made everything to come together. Um, um, it's, you know, it's a, a masterpiece story that, um, that he did. And I'm can't believe I have two pages. You know, when I had one page, it's like, wow, I can't believe I have one page, but to get two consecutive pages, I was just like, um, you know, it's kind of a dream come true. So, um, that's breathtaking. You know, um, some of the, a lot of the pieces we talked about have that aesthetics and nostalgia. 
uh, pieces like this add the word historic, given it's the first appearance of Swamp Thing. And then you get that panel three on the second page with this the cover, cover image of her brushing her hair. I mean, it has so many elements that make this uh, just an exquisite piece. Yeah, without and, question. And someone, I think Rich said that the mustache gentleman in the, uh, Damien in the first page, that's actually Kaluta or drawn yeah. for his, his image. Uh, yeah, and I, I think Alec might be, uh, might be Wrightson, but I, I'm, I'd have to look at my description to be sure because I interesting. He himself in this one, but I'm not 100% sure. So these are the pages that you kind of are glad that they were in collectors' hands and preserved, right? You hear a lot of these things where these, pe these art pieces were either destroyed or given away or just they, they just never came out to... To, to, to survive in the hobby. It's, it's great to know that these even exist, much less owned uh, by somebody that, that, that we know. Uh, terrific, terrific. Yeah, that's a beautiful piece. And, and, and it's true. The thing that I, I am always impressed about is that you know we really are care, caretakers of the work, right? And, and I can't think of any other, you know, can you imagine if historical documents from you know, the, a thousand years ago or 800 years ago that, you know, that they're just getting carried around in people's portfolios. <laughs> and yet here we are, we are making, you know, making sure that they could be passed on to the next co collector one day, whoever that might be. And it's a, it's, it, it's a weird burden at the same time, because you really have to think about how are you going to take, you know, make sure that it doesn't go, you know, burn up in a fire, or, you know, you're going to buy a safe that can protect it. What about water damage? All those things, you know, are you going to leave it on your wall in a, in a, in a frame that's not going to, you know, protect it from UV, right, so that it doesn't fade? Absolutely. There's, there's so many things that go into it. And, and you know, for West, for you to eventually own those those two pieces is just fantastic. And it's a testament to the people who owned it before you that took care of it. No doubt. And one of the things that you learn in this hobby, and certainly West and I, uh, as we learn from others, other collectors, is a transaction, a sale or a buying of these pieces it's not just a, a, a transaction. I mean, people want to sell to somebody they know will cherish the piece and protect it and preserve it in, in a way that, that, that gives the piece its due. And not just, you know, hey, I'm just getting rid of it. That, so the, the stewardship from collector to collector is so important. And, and I, I, I find that all the time. I mean, when, I, when I'm inquiring about a piece or, or someone's asking to buy one of my pieces, I think about that. You know, what, what kind of collector is this? Is this somebody who would, who would certainly cherish this piece and really, really enjoy it in a way that, 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 that gives it its due and, and, and preserve it and, and be a custodian for the, the next person to own uh, one of these treasures? So again, we, we should count ourselves lucky to be in a hobby where, we're, where we get to, to, to unite over things that, that, that we're passionate about. And, uh, you know, it's just a, it's just a great, great, great hobby to be a part of. I agree. It's a, and I can tell you, you know, you both really have a deep appreciation for it. And that's when we were, we were talking about doing this show with the both of you, I was feeling a little overwhelmed to be honest, because you know, your experiences in the hobby are, you know, far outweigh the time that I've, I've had in it. And uh, I was almost thinking, I got to have Glenn sit in here with me because he'll, <laughs> he'll help me. He, you know, He's book smart. He's much smarter than I am. He'll he'll help me. But no, this has been fantastic talking to you guys. Really no, you did great. <laughs> yeah, it's an honor, Bill. Thank you for having us. And you know, it's great to see you, West. And I know yes, you, you, you shared you, you shared just a portion of your collection online. And certainly, uh, 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 you know, I, I love to see the, the how how that evolves over time. And and when you do have those great pieces added, you know, I'm one of the ones that cheering you on. So, well, I'm looking to. I'm looking forward to seeing the other 50 to 55% of the collection <laughs> hidden away. I think we got a little glimpse there in your video, but. Yeah, and no, I'm looking forward to that as well. So I, 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 love, uh, I love sharing things on CAF and, and, and hopefully if I do this right, I'll, I'll be able to, 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 to do this for a while, so. Well, we gotta make sure that you don't buy any more new pieces so that you can start posting the old ones. <laughs> 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 There's probably well, no chance in that, right? <laughs> not chance, not a chance. No, I'm I'm too addicted to this stuff. But uh, no, thank you, Bill, and and everyone who's joined on this. It's been a real pleasure and a real real honor to be part of this. And, uh, and uh, uh, this uh, oh. Ruben keeps asking <laughs> Ruben. me, how do you pronounce your last name? Since I did, it's pronounced Stefan. 
Yes, I I, uh, I learned too late after saying Stefan, I think is what I was saying for uh, for two or three episodes when I was trying to tease this one and and uh, Wes let, kind of let me know how, what the proper pronunciation was. On they anything. wanted to give you some European chic. <laughs> right. Well, even like when we, when I interviewed Bill Roberge, I, oh, in, yeah. I, I kept thinking it was Roberge or something. And, <laughs> and he corrected me before we went online. So thankfully I didn't, you know, butcher that when we, when we, we did that, but I, I should have known better West. I should have known what better, but <laughs> yeah. What are you going to do? I, I'm sure I mispronounce artist names all the time too. Some of those can be really tricky. Yeah. Uh, yes. More than I, I'd like to, to admit, I've, I've done that. And and see, so, you now Ruben wants to make sure I, on your last name as well. Do you know? Uh, Mauricio. Uh, a little bit easier than than, than it sounds, but um, you'd be surprised. I get these great, you know, I'm I, I get these great Italian restaurant reservations in New York all the time, and. They say Dino Mauricio, and they gave me a great table. Then I show up, and they see me, and they go, "The strangest looking Italian person I've ever met." So, uh, but it's Mauricio. Yeah. Yes, I got. Uh, I did get a few comments when I made the thumbnail for this show because of how I had to position you both with with West on the one side and, and Dino you, you to the other side because just you know Dino, your your the imagery just fit really well the way I did it. Yeah. And, uh, and somebody was like, somebody said. Uh, I didn't know West was, you know, was of that nationality. And I'm like, <laughs> no, I, I, no, it's, it's my fault. It's my, you know, I, should have, I, I but I didn't want to say you put West name first and Dino's name second. So, you know, but I it's, did. I, it's I, all good among friends. I just, I just like the fact that these, these interviews and these episodes really get to, to, you get to know the people behind the collections and not just be known for some of the pieces that that inner gallery, but but you know get get a sense of their history, their origin, and uh, uh, why they enjoy this hobby and 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 some of the pieces that that they can share. So uh, good. So uh, glad, glad, really glad to be able to kind of share my story today. <laughs> uh, no, it's uh, sorry. Yes, no. My name is very easy. Bill Cox. Fox. <laughs> yeah, he's easy. You can't, it's, you know, it, you can't mess that one up, but, um, but no, no, it's like I said, I told you guys in the green room that, that this, these, these, uh, chats that we do have been fantastic for me as well, because it's helped me really connect with the people who've used CAF in, in a way that I never thought I'd have the opportunity to, to do. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't go to shows as often as I used to even before COVID and, uh, and really those last like five to eight years were a little different, you know, for me, you know, as far as like enjoying the hobby, like I should, and and being able to talk with with two collectors like yourselves who've been in the hobby for so long and have experiences that that I'll never have, but just learning about, you know, the things that you've done in the hobby and the way you view your collections and 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 being like you said, good custodians of the work is just, uh, you know, it, it it just means a lot to me, and I think it means a lot to the people who watch these these chats as well. So. I, I thank you both for taking the time this evening. Absolutely. And sooner or later, someone's going to have to interview you. <laughs> yeah. The history oh, behind all know. the pieces behind you, Bill, that's a story in itself. I yeah. Yeah. Memories. No, there are, there are. And you know, Felix actually took a stab at interviewing me at the, uh, during the November comic art live, we, we ended up talking more about lots of different things, but, but that was his, his impression too, was the one to kind of get the story out there. And I talk, I get to talk about myself every week. So, uh in in that way i think everybody's getting to know a little bit more about me as well so yeah. Uh, but yeah it'll happen someday probably but um and uh, you know all i can say is again thank you so much and don't don't sign off when I, we when we go to the green room here because i want to not talk at all not at all of course all right. and then thank you everyone for joining as well and feel free to reach out to west and i if we can ever be helpful to any one of you uh this is a, this is a hobby of us and and we're always willing to kind of share some thoughts and and uh and talk about art anytime yeah absolutely thanks. and thanks for starting the second 18 years uh, that's right better than the first. it's groundhog day how appropriate right <laughs> oh that's right I another 18 know. years of calf i think we're we're, we're in success so, <laughs> how about so that? in 18 years from now you'll have to interview us again yeah uh, well, i can do that i'll be happy to do that i'll be around <laughs> all right gentlemen and everybody tuning in tonight thank you so much uh be sure to check out the uh, dueling dealer show tomorrow i'm sure it's going to be twice as enjoyable as it was this past week all right good night <laughs>